you can look at this picture here. Hopefully you saw some things you recognized in the video, but the monuments in DC, our nation's capital, uh, the Washington Monument, just uh, the Pentagon. It took the US Army Corps of Engineers only 15 months to build what used to be, uh, and it still is one of the largest, but used to be the largest office space uh, in all of the nation. So just uh, incredible. We built the Panama Canal, uh, various dams across the country, too many to count um, as part of our flood control mission, but now have secondary missions like recreation and um, hydropower. Let's see, oh, uh, any sort of disaster response. There's a couple here that you can see. Um, any kind of disaster across the nation, the Corps of Engineers has responded to it uh, over the last uh, century at least. And um, anytime there's a crisis, right? So uh, you guys are probably too young to remember 9-11, but I'm sure you've learned about it since then. But the Corps responded after the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and helped sort through debris and clean up. And uh, more, more recently, I know you guys remember this, um, during the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, we answered the nation's call to provide additional uh, hospital space. So you see on the slide here, alternate care facilities. And this was, you know, uh, a very challenging time where we just didn't have enough bed space for people that needed treatment. And so the Corps of Engineers had to really think on its feet and quickly deliver facilities that would be safe for people to get seen and safe for um, all the people treating them. So quite simply, um, the Corps of Engineers has been solving our nation's toughest challenges for over 248 years. So you might be asking, okay, you've done a lot over the last two centuries, but what are you doing right now? Fair question. Uh, we build things. Um, I think that's probably one of the things you most recognized in the video, but uh, or in the any of the pictures throughout this. Obviously, the Corps of Engineers build things, but we you might not know we also keep all of our nation's waterways, our rivers, um, coastal. We we keep those waterways open so that uh, tr boats with and barges with goods can can safely. Uh, travel up and down and deliver goods that we need to keep the nation's economy strong. We build uh, levees along rivers and dams that do flood protection uh, to make you know people safer. We restore and protect the environment. Um, we talked about disaster response. Just right now, uh, the Corps of Engineers is out responding to um, remember Super Typhoon. Uh, Ma War that hit Guam. Uh, we're still out there providing temporary roofs and, and housing and debris cleanup on Guam. The fires that just ravaged the island of Hawaii or Maui and Hawaii, uh, the Corps of Engineers is out trying to provide assistance uh, for all the folks in Maui. The, we are still responding to hurricanes from last year in Florida and in Puerto Rico. So just any natural disaster that strikes the U.S. or U.S. territory, the Corps of Engineers is out there. Um, time, to, time for a fact check. We also do historical preservation and we um, have archeologists. So fact check, you guys write this down. The Corps of Engineers uh, has the most intact T-Rex fossil in all of the world. We discovered it on one of our project sites and we own it now. Now we loan it to the Smithsonian, but it's ours. And you might think that's insane, uh, but it's true. Feel free to fact check me. We also do geospatial stuff. So if you guys have, uh, you guys can Google what they look like, but if you guys have ever been out and seen uh, little brass plates that are in the ground called benchmarks, and they'll have the Corps of Engineers castle on them. Uh, the Corps of Engineers has been a leader in surveying basically the country and these, you'll find these benchmarks all over. Uh, so maybe if you're out, you can take a look and, and recognize it, but oh, feel free to fact check me. You, you say benchmarks. Um, 
So basically, we have all kinds of people that work in the Corps of Engineers. Uh, you can see, uh, of course, we have engineers and scientists and technicians, but we also need real estate experts because in order to build, you got to have the land, right? So uh, we have contract specialists, we have lawyers, we have uh, finance people, human resource people. We are um, just a very diverse organization um, that's, that's really continuing to solve our nation's toughest challenges. So let me just end on this. And, I, and this is where I really want to impress upon you guys that, um, you know, STEM and engineering is important and it's all around us. Every bridge you cross, every building that you're in, um, every dam that you see, levee, lock, uh, you know, when you look around, STEM is all around you and we need you. I wish I could see all your faces. I am encouraged to hear there's over 600 people participating today, um, but we need all of you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I was doing some research to prepare for this and uh, I found out that a 2021 Pew study found out, um, found that we are 173,000 short in the STEM field and that could grow to upwards of a million in the next 10 years. I found out that women are underrepresented in STEM fields. We only make up 15% of the engineers across the workforce. I found out that Blacks and Hispanics are also underrepresented in, um, in STEM degrees and jobs. And so I think that how we fix this is talk to you sooner. And that's what I'm hoping to do today is, is tell you all that we need all of you, everyone. Um, and we hope to close opportunity gaps that may exist by getting you encouraged in a STEM field early on. And so I would encourage all of you to continue to participate in great events like this. Um, you can quick Google search, find out lots of other offerings in your areas, wherever you may be, um, because we really do need every, every one of you, um, if you're interested, um, you know, to get involved. I will say that, um, you know, th we've had recent huge historic investments in um, projects, the bipartisan infrastructure law that Congress passed, the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that Congress passed, you know, has contributed to just, just the Corps of Engineers alone having a $90 billion, that's billion with a B, workload, 90 billion. This is historic. But what that has caused is a shortage in uh, construction fields. And so if you're like, hmm, you know, a, a degree in engineering or, um, or science or technology, maybe not for, for me. I get it. Consider, uh, you know, studying a construction trade, become an electrician, a welder, uh, a plumber. All of these fields are woefully short. Uh, recent studies uh, from 2023 say we're 430,000. That's almost half a million short to deliver all of this construction that Congress wants us to do um, and, and uh, continue building the houses and, and everything else that you see around you that, that construction, we need construction fields to do. So, you know, I, I wanna make sure you guys are aware of that too. Um, a, a degree in a STEM field is great. A uh, learning a construction trade is also something your nation needs you to do. And so, um, oh, another point, uh, a Forbes study from 2023 said that engineering degrees are, have the highest entry-level salaries per average, highest, and the top 10 had all of the engineering fields. So um, if you want to solve problems, if you want to help people, if you want to make a difference, and if you want to get paid, Consider a, uh, a studying STEM, uh, consider a construction trade, and consider a, a STEM career in the future.
And so I just want to end with this. Uh, and I'm, this is going to be a little bit interactive, even though I won't be able to hear you. I want everyone to repeat after me. Everyone that's out there, everyone that I wish I could see but can't, I want you to say this. I can do hard things. Did you guys do it? I don't know. I don't know if all of you did. All right, everybody take a deep breath. Deep breath. And say it with me. I can, I can do hard, do hard things. things. <laughs> and and this is why you guys might be, thank you. I had one person, uh, it's very validating. Um, the reason that I can tell you this with confidence, and I want all of you to listen, wherever you are, I understand we have a very diverse group that is listening in today. The reason that I know this is possible is that if a girl from the end of the dirt road in Fair Play, South Carolina can grow up to become an army colonel and commander of the best uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineer district in the entire organization, then anything is possible. Okay. And with that, I am, I think, are we doing some um, question and answers maybe? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Colonel Mann. Um, that was so awesome, inspiring. And, you know, I have heard U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for so long, but like fully understanding what all that entails, like it takes some sort of connection like this. So we really appreciate it. Um, I actually uh, cashed in on a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project recently. I was in Seattle and I went to go watch the salmon run at um, <laughs> one of the locks. And it was a U.S. Army Corps of Engineer um, operated lock. So that was really cool because it has a functional element. It has an educational element. Um, it was it was a really great time. So we appreciate all those projects because there's so much when it comes to functionality, but also just serving the public, serving the community and providing really great opportunities. So thank you so much for that. Um, we actually do have quite a few questions. So okay. I'm going to go ahead and kind of facilitate those. Um, another option we could do, we do actually have like seven minutes. So we got a little bit of time. So that'll be great because we do have so many questions. Um, you are also welcome to raise your hand and we could do the unmute function and allow you to talk and try and get as many in that way as well. Um, so if you do have questions and you are comfortable with your mic system, we can allow you to talk to um, ask those as well. So I'll go ahead and get started with some of the Q&A function ones. So <laughs> you really piqued a lot of interest with that dinosaur. Uh, oh, yeah. Factoid. So they wanted you to possibly repeat that little fact check. And then okay. question if you know much about what went into the preservation of that find. Okay. So absolutely. Uh, we, so we have a function to uh, preserve historic sites. And so as part of our regulatory mission, um, if you're a, an industry or a, a private citizen that wants to develop on land, you have to submit permits just to make sure um, that there's nothing, you know, historic on there, some sort of landmark or um, burial ground or, but, um, and then if you encounter something, we have to go out and validate that it's still okay to keep digging there. Well, on one of our sites, we, uh, the developer uncovered the remains of a T-Rex, uh, like true story. And it's, um, we named the T-Rex. It was named Winkleman after the archeologist uh, that actually determined what it was and, uh, and then had a big part in preserving it. And now it is with the Smithsonian on loan. So, because we wanted to make sure that we could share this T-Rex with everybody else. But who would have thought the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, would have been a part of one of the greatest archaeological ar archaeological finds in history. Fact check me. Write it down. Google it. <laughs> years of college was needed. Sure. Um, so we have a couple of other questions. So. Okay. Um, and these two kind of go hand in hand. So one of the questions was about salary. You did talk about how engineers 
have some of the best salaries coming out of college. Yes. Um, could you maybe comment on what like an entry level engineer salary looks like? Um, and then sure. the next question is, how much school do you need to maybe get one of those positions to get where you are? All that good stuff. Okay. So to get where I am uh, in the, you know, you would have to join the army, which there is plenty of opportunity for that. Uh, but if you just want to work in the Corps of Engineers, uh, a four-year degree from, from a school would, would be sufficient. And the starting salary depends on sort of where you live, um, but it's sixty to 80000 uh, is the average across the country for starting, starting salary. And just a couple things about the Corps of Engineers, we have co-op programs with colleges where you don't have to wait till the end of four years to figure out, um, you know, if you if you're going to like it and uh, practice it. You can come uh, work at the Corps of Engineers for a summer and get paid internships, right? Like paid uh, opportunities to work in the field where you're studying and and see if you're going to like it. Um, like I said, the Corps of Engineers is not just engineers. We have real estate, we have contracting, we have lawyers, we have um, all, all sorts of stuff. So, but to, to be a, an engineer entry level, it's four years of college. Eventually you can go back and get your master's and, and that's an, another year. I spent a year at um, University of Missouri Science and Technology where the army let me get my master's degree and, um, and uh, work on, I, I've also worked on my technical certifications and licensing along the way as well. So I'm a professional registered engineer in the state of, of Missouri. Now that that's to be, um, you know, to, to go to college, that's one option. There is also the option to work in the construction uh, field itself. And that's, you know, trade schools. And those are one, you know, less than a year, two years, uh, depending on, you know, how, how skilled you want to go with it to be, an electrician, a welder, a plumber, a carpentry, masonry specialist, you know, those sort of things. So um, if you want to be more in the field doing the actual construction, that is also an option that I want to en encourage people to consider too. A four-year college degree may not be for everyone, but having a skill under, you know, getting um, training in a, in a trade will also be um, be the path to a, a good um, career. Thank you so much, Colonel Mann. Um, so it looks like we have a couple of hands up. So uh, Catalina Martin, uh, would you like to uh, voice your question? So I just, yep. Hi, Catalina. Yep, you're good to go, Catalina. I think we, we heard you. Catalina, do you want to ask your question? Oh. All right. Catalina, you want to ask a question? Can she type in the chat? Yeah, maybe maybe we'll have her uh, type in the chat. All okay. right. Um, let's see, another question we have. So we have a question, have you participated in, in any wars? So you have been deployed. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that and, and what that was like? Absolutely. Um, so let's see, I, we had uh, several opportunities to participate in different fronts across the globe as we were fighting the global war on terror that followed the 9-11 attacks on this nation. And so I served in the Philippines on a special operations task force as their engineer. Um, I also served 15 months in um, Iraq where we were building things and training the Iraqi army engineers how to build things. And so it was a lot of not only taking care of the facilities that our own soldiers needed, but training the Iraqi engineers uh, to do engineering things for themselves. And, um, but the army has sent me everywhere. Um, I've been to over 20 something countries uh, doing pretty incredible uh, things for to advance engineering across the globe. Things that you, you know, from somebody like me, from fair play, two words, fact check me, 
uh, South Carolina, things that I never thought I would get the opportunity to do. So um, sure, I'm proud of my time in combat. The Corps of Engineers, you know, they're in all of these places too, but not necessarily, you don't have to be a soldier to be in the Corps and it's on a volunteer basis. So you volunteer for the opportunities that you want to do. You have a lot more choice as to where you go and how long and what you want to do. Or as you saw from the map, the Corps of Engineers is everywhere in this country. We are everywhere. Look for the red and white uh, castle and or Google it and, um, and look for an opportunity uh, to get out and see some of our stuff. If you reach out and contact us, uh, we can get you tours or show you the salmon ladder or, um, you know, whatever cool engineering thing is, is near where you're at. We can connect you to that. So you don't have to be a soldier to be in the Corps of Engineers. Um, if you're a civilian in the Corps of Engineers, you have a lot more choice as to where you go and what you do. Um, but it's all good. It's amazing, the stuff that we do and, and where we're at, which is everywhere. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Colonel Mann. Um, do you mind if we ask two more quick questions? I don't mind at all. I don't <laughs> want to be respectful of all the other speakers, but all right, I well, can we'll stay here all day. <laughs> all of them. I, I want to uh, stay well, here with them all day. We appreciate it. And um, Breland, we will pop right over to you very soon. Um, so we have a great question from Peace Academy. Um, when it comes to environmental science and well-being, how can we better our society for future generations? So you guys are probably thinking about this a lot. What are some ways that you guys are planning, designing, all that good stuff? Oh, we are. Um, we The Corps of Engineers has a lot of effort dedicated to not only studying and understanding the impacts of climate change, but also preventing and, and uh, future uh, uh, damage to our environment. We are part of a large effort to regulate. And so, you know, telling, telling industry or telling uh, private uh, folks what they uh, shouldn't do on their property so that, you know, we're preserving the environment, we're protecting endangered species, we're, um, you know, protecting wetlands. That's a big one that we do. You know, we are all for development and for this nation, for the economy, but we've got to do it in an environmentally responsible way. The other thing that the Corps of Engineer does is build resilience into our design. So wherever we're at, we are constantly thinking, how do we protect this coastline uh, from sea level rise? How do we protect the reef? How do we uh, protect this community if, from the, if the river rises? How do we, so we are building um, these sustainable design concepts into uh, everything that we do. We have centers and labs um, that are across the country with really, really smart scientists to, to work in one of those labs. You need a little bit more school than four, four years. Uh, they are some of the leading minds on uh, studying what the actual effects of climate change are and figuring out how we prevent it and protect the environment moving forward. All right. Thank you so much, Colonel Mann. Um, I feel like I learned so much. I'm sure that our listeners also learned a lot. Um, audience, also, thank you so much for your participation. These are great questions. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing even more of these. Um, so, Colonel Mann, uh, have a great day, and thank you so much for your time and your resources. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. I wish every one of you guys the best. Um, and uh, it's just been an honor to talk to you guys today. I'm, I'm down at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, looking at some projects. So I'm coming to you from a hotel room before we run out. But I can't think of something more important that I could be doing right now. And wish you all the best. You guys can do hard things, okay? And uh, consider the Corps of Engineers. Have a great day, everyone. Awesome. Thank you. Bye.
All right, so now we are going to switch over to another wonderful speaker we have here today. Um, Breland Tilford is going to join us. So uh, my moderator, Autumn, is gonna help get him set up. Oh, there we go. And I'm just gonna do a quick little introduction. Um, so Breland is the founder and hands-on CEO for Media Production, uh, Media Pros Productions. Um, he was born and raised in Louisville. Kentucky and is carving his path as a creative dynamo in the video industry. Um, he serves as the creative director and CEO, as I mentioned, for Media Pros Production, and he is innovative in his practices. He thinks beyond conventions and brings a fresh perspective to his projects. Um, for more than a decade, he's woven his creative threads into a diverse and dynamic tapestry of entertainment. Um, he's collaborated with people like Usher, Jack Harlow, Vivica Fox, Neo, Ken Griffey Jr., and the hilarious Gary Owens. Um, his adventure has also so seen him take on a variety of creative roles. He brings visions to fruition, and he takes the lead on substantial undertakings. These include things such as the Hideaway Music Festival, videography for ESPN, history at the Roots 101 African History Museum, the Presbyterian Church USA General Assembly, photographer and editor for Wave TV, Kentucky Derby coverage, Midwest Music Festival, and the University of Athletics Department, and much more. Breland's impact isn't confined to the silver screen. Breland is dedicated to nurturing fellow students in the realms of broadcasting and entertainment. As the trailblazing founder of the Trailblazer program, he's guiding budding creatives to unlock their potential by delving into the intricacies of cinematic production. This program offers an invaluable peek beyond, beyond, behind the curtain, giving young talents the tools to shine in the industry. It imbues students with confidence to pursue their passions. He's a storyteller who paints with pixels, a creative visionary who thrives on pushing boundaries, and a mentor guiding the next generation of talents. Um, here at Kentucky Science Center, we are so excited to have him join us today. And we are looking forward to a teen-oriented project that we'll probably chat about in a little bit um, that we are collaborating with Breland on. So Breland, if you wanna go ahead and uh, take over, we are very excited to hear from you. That uh, that intro, I need you to just start doing that every time that I like pretty much come on camera. I need to just bring you on with me because that was great. I appreciate that. Um, first, I want to say it's a truly an honor to be uh, here with you all today um, at this incredible science museum program. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a place that obviously imagination knows no bounds. And, uh, you know, for me, it's like my name is Breland Tilford, as you all heard. And I just want to share a little bit about me and 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 who I am and, and how I found my passion, right? My fas passion for creation, my passion for video, for just being a creative. And um, before I dive into my journey though, I uh, wanna ask you all a question. You know, uh, who are you, right? Uh, what are your dreams and uh, your passions and wildest aspirations? And, uh, and in our process today of me talking to you all, you know, I'm hoping that maybe that can give you all some inspiration to finding that out for yourself. At, and, and, and you all can see how when I was at your age, I learned that for myself as well. You know, growing up, I wasn't like, I was just like many of you, I'm sorry. And I had questions uh, about the world around me. And I was curious about how things worked, you know, why the sky was blue <laughs> and why plants grew towards the sun. Um, but there was one thing that I truly ignited my, my, uh, my passion and my curiosity, and that was film. And uh, with that, I'm going to just go and just get you all a little bit of a glimpse. I know you all heard a little bit about what I've done, but I want you all to kind of see what I've done. Uh, so if we could go ahead and roll that video.
something you ain't solved. I ain't solved. Real talk, man. All right, so you all got kind of got a glimpse of, of me and and what I do and and what I've done and, and, and how I've been kind of pursuing the journey that I'm on. Um, and so with that, uh, just like like I said when I was you all, like all it all it was was just a seed being planted in me. Like, and it was actually at Francis Parker when I realized the question was brought to me when I first went to school, which was Breland, what do you want to do when you get older? And I've never been asked that question before in my life. Um, and with that, like, I took a moment and I realized, okay, what do I love? And I realized that like, I love film. That was the song. thing I could do I anything, anytime, talk, any place. And I just, that was my, that was my thing. And so for me, that was the seed that I planted. And, and I could have easily just, you know, wrote it off and not, you know, thought anything more about that and just let it be going. But I allowed to, like, pretty much take that seed and, and build that into to what I wanted to do now, which is create this company. So if we go to the next slide, obviously for a seed to be able to grow, it needs water, right? It needs water, it needs, it needs nutrients, it needs, it needs information. And I think that when you find your passion for something, that is it, it's, it's taking information as much as you can. And, and, and not, it might not be being able to be on a set right away or being able to uh, go be the basketball player you want to be right away, Hey, when you're taking the knowledge and taking the information and the skills and trying to learn that through books, through people around you, through YouTube, through different platforms and things, that's when you can start to build in and grow and develop, you know, those skills and develop that passion into something else. And just like a plant, you know, you grow, <laughs> right? So it's like you take that, you take that information and, and, and sooner before you know it, you're not growing in a way that's actually elevating you no, to a height talk. that talk, you weren't at before, right? And so in that process of developing, in that process of like, you know, finding yourself and moving on to the next thing, that's where, you know, as you grow and you grow, you start to take form and take shape. And I think that for me, it's taking shape when I was able to see, okay, I love film. And even though like I've never really had the opportunity to on a camera until I, I was in college, I learned about it, I studied it, and I like try to immerse myself in it as much as I could. And the next thing I knew, like the film world was kind of starting to resonate around me, right? And I was able to go into to school and, 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 and pursue that and, and be able to be around people that understood, the had a passion similar to me as that. And in that, you know, I started realizing like I am a filmmaker, right? And I started doing to be on set. And so that's where the passion, that's where your passion that was originally a seed, where that turns into a career, right? And that's where like, you know, you figure, that's where kind of where the, where the road meets the, the rubber, where it's like, okay, like now you've figured out who you are, now that you've discovered that you have, you've built this talent, people think that talent just comes from, how long is talent to know? Like the talent can, can be work, it's work ethic, right? And I think when you find something you care about, and if you just put in a little bit of energy per day towards that, you grow, right? Really right? Well. You grow towards that. And that's and that's pretty much it. And even with that, even though that when you find your career and you feel you have some success and the thing that you that you uh, nurtured, you still feel and can experience a little bit of resilience or, 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 or resistance, right? You, you, you can still experience, you know, issues personally and in your career, right? Things don't always work. Things aren't always the proper fit, right? There's always things that happen in your life that can cause you, if you can go back one, things that happen in your life that can cause you to, uh, to maybe question if this is really what you wanna do. To make you question like, is this like, do I love this, right? And that's, in anything in life, that's what you go through, you're like, but it's up to you to be able to like, in those moments, keep pushing forward. And just like a tree, right? A tree hits, has wind hit the tree. And in that, like, 
as that wind, because of that wind that's hitting that tree, it's allowing roots down below to grow further and further. So that now, when that when that same, you know, like wind wind speed that's hitting the tree is coming, you know, a year from now, it's it doesn't feel the same because they they built up that that mu that muscle and that strength to be able to to fight through that that resilience, right? And I think that a lot of times this is where kind of where a lot of people. Um, you know, they, they lose sight. Like for me, my, my life wasn't always just like, oh, you know, trajectory. Right, right. No, no, no. I, I had moments in my life that I messed up, right? Where I made mistakes, right? Or I didn't have right people around me that could support me and nurture me and help me grow into what I'm doing today. But it's up to me to stay in it despite those setbacks or despite those obstacles to keep moving forward no matter what. And you can be successful. KFC didn't start, or Colonel Sanders didn't start KFC until what literally he was like in his 80s or so right and now it's everywhere across the world so it's just that mindset of like no matter what it is that you want you can go after it you can get it and in that when you find that when you get that your career when you get through that that's when you start really being able to realize who you are right because before you were just a tree right but now you can actually like be a tree and know what kind of tree that you're going to be right you could be an apple tree Right, you could be a pear tree, you could be a you know like a, a walnut tree, right? Like, but it's like that's when you when you find your purpose, when you find your passion, and you find that skill that you've been able to develop. At that point, you can then be able to say, okay, like I have, I'm bearing fruit, right? I'm giving life back. Life gave me, so now I can give life back. So, being able to take the information and the experiences you've been through. And now like how I'm doing right now, you can speak about it and talk about your story and give life to some other person that's here on the stream or, you know, that's there with you or what, what not, and be able to impact them and say, okay, and give them the, the belief that I can do this too, right? And so that's kind of the process of, of how uh, you get to, to, to where you can have your own studio or have your own success. It's just, it's, but it's understanding the process of life, right? The process of giving and giving and that, that effect. And so, um, so I'm just thankful that I'm able to hear, be here and talk to you all a little bit about what I'm doing. And so for me, as you see here, upcoming storytellers, that's, that's my way of, of giving back, right? I, I've, you know, I've been able to, as you all saw, done, do a lot of different projects and work with celebrities like Dion and Jack Harlow and, you know, Usher and all that types of people. But, it's not, it's, it's, more, it's things like this that really upcoming storytellers that really I feel like I'm passionate about to be able to give back my knowledge and my skills to kids like young kids, like young youth like you all, right? Like, and so um, with that, um, I want to know like, what's your why, right? Like, what are some things that you all um, might be passionate about? And feel free to send that in the chat. And I'm going to look at them right now and take a look. We can see. In, Let's see, so. Yeah, so um, students, attendees, if you would like to post, you can post in the Q&A, like what you're passionate but, uh, about. Oh, you can't hear what I'm saying. Right. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, y'all can hear me now. But yeah, can y'all hear me now? I want to make sure you all can't not. Can y'all hear me? Do I need to restart? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. And um, also, Jenny, if, are you, are you like, there? your hand and talk about what you're passionate about you can do that too we're all set all right um but yeah so uh with that i just kind of wanted to leave it at that and um yeah if you all have any questions or let me see if i pull this pull this chat up um yeah dang we had music in the background the whole time um yeah well with that can if there's any questions or anything that you all might want to uh you all have yeah feel free to 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 shoot in my way and um and yeah that's kind of where we're at All right, um, Maddox, you have the ability to talk if you would like to tell us a little bit about what you're passionate about, maybe what some of your goals are, what kind of drives you? Um, what drives me is the passion to start building some big stuff, like set up next generations with something new, something, some, 
something big, like, you know, I'm going into engineering and robotics because it's just my passion to make machines. And personally, I think that could be a big way of saving the environment from current problems. So Maddox, thank you so much. That was, I, I love how you articulated that. And I love to hear that. It's so exciting to hear about goals and dreams, especially for your generation. And I am happy to hear that you are ready to go achieve those great things. So thank you so much for sharing that, Maddox. And then I'm seeing if, Breland, can you hear us? Oh, I can't hear you now. Did you hear what Maddox said? Okay, okay, I can hear you now. Yep. What okay. was that, Maddox? Sorry. Yeah, Maddox, would you? Like, I think Breland lost his connection for a second. Would you like to reiterate what you just said about your goals and what you're hoping to do and accomplish? So um, Maddox, feel free to chime in if, if you want to speak again. But Maddox was telling us about how um, they're going to pursue engineering and robotics. And they just want to start building these great things that's going to help society out and doing these big projects. So uh, really some awesome drive and excited to see that happen, Maddox. Awesome. I'm sure you'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think robotics is definitely the way to go. It's funny. I was, there's a place that we, we drove by on a trip. That's a whole like facility. That's probably a few, it's like probably four or five acres big and it's all robotics and it's managed by like four different people. And it's this whole big facility, right? Like that's where we're moving towards robotics, AI, like technology is like the way of the future. So the more that you can know the functionality of that from like a specific level, the more, you know, of an asset you can be for not just, you know, a uh, manufacturing company, but also like a com creative company or, you know, a distribution company or, or you know, so all types of things, e-commerce. So, um, so yeah, like that's a great, great uh, field to be in for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we have someone who posted, they're really interested in possibly pursuing like video game design and production, but also the possibility of production when it comes to film and music. What kind of advice could you give them? Yeah, so the, the most advice, the best advice I can give you is just to, first off, don't wait until you get to school or until you get to college to pursue it. Like, do what you can now, right? Connect with people now and learn as much as you can now because it's going to put you ahead of everybody else. So. Um, when you, like for me, for example, like when I went to school, like I, I could, there was weekends and days, like I didn't have to go on to, to film with my, um, the guy that I was like PAing or interning under in town Archie. Uh, there was, there was times where I didn't have to go with him, see, hang with him on the weekend, right? It was, a, it was a Saturday night or Saturday and I had to be there at 8am where he needed, he needed on set. And I mean, you know, I, I want to sleep in, right? I've been playing basketball, you know, at, at school and all these sports during the week. I wanted to rest, but even though I could have said no and not went, because I went, I learned so much and I was able to be exposed to things that a lot of kids that were my age didn't get exposed to, which when I got to college, I was able to, some of the knowledge that came, that came easy for me, people were just now learning about, right? So um, the more you can immerse yourself at the age you all ages and the points you all are right now, the more you'll be able to position yourself to where you'll be more, um, you know, competitive or more, have, have more of an understanding to where you can go out on your own sooner than may maybe others, right? So, yeah, good question. Awesome. Thank you, Breland. Yeah, why yeah. wait? If you are interested or you want to explore something, you know, reach out to people. Like, you just need to ask and you're going to find out that there are all these people, people like Breland who dedicate their time to help us on projects. You know, there's there's people out here who want to inspire you and they want to help like cultivate and nurture your passion. And it just is, you know, you seeking it out and exploring those opportunities. So um, great stuff. Thank you, Breland. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to check and see. Um, so we have some questions kind of what kind of salary can you expect when you're in production? And then 
what's the demand for uh, your profession? I'm, I'm guessing it's becoming increasingly popular considering this is a very uh, important form of media, but um, yeah, could you give us a little more scoop kind of on those details about the profession? Yeah, for sure. So um, I just got back from Chicago from a shoot, right? Like literally at 1 a.m. last night. <laughs> and then I've got another, you know, shoot, you know, tomorrow and then I'll be in Atlanta. Like, like so it's very demanding, um, especially being in Louisville and being in, in, in the Kentucky area, this region with different things happen. There's a lot more of a need in that, not just from a commercial film standpoint, but just even from a a lot of companies are realizing the value of social media and YouTube and all these platforms. And so um, when you can really understand the algorithms and especially you all, because a lot of the things that come easy for you, like for me, it was Facebook, right? Facebook and Instagram. When those were coming up, like I knew those easy because that's just what everyone was on. Like it was, it's just, it was easy. It came natural for me to like understand how to like do things to really get people's attention. And I think for you all, it's the same thing, but it's like TikTok, right? It's, it's still, it's, it's YouTube, it's Instagram, it's these other platforms um, uh, where if you can, if you can learn these things, you can, work here in Louisville. I mean, we got a studio right downtown. So if there's anybody in the area that wants to work or get involved, we're definitely down to get, bring you all into what we're doing. But, you know, I think there's always a need to, to create content. Everyone understands the value. Content is king, right? Video is king. It's not, photos are great, copy's great, but really like video is, is all those things that you see it, you feel it, you hear it. Like it's all these emotions that you're gonna get from, from something that's, that without being there. So, um, so yeah, so, so the need is huge. The salaries, like as far as like rates, I mean, they're good, right? Like I've been coming in, obviously, like you gotta prove yourself. So I think the, the biggest thing uh, that I, advice that I'll give is to not focus on the money at this point, right? Because in this industry, there really isn't a cap to how much you can make. It's really the value that you bring to the table and, and it's, in. And, you know, there's, and what I mean by that is, you know, you can, there's producers, directors, and I mean, you've seen like the budgets for films, multi-million dollar productions, those are real things. Like people are getting paid, like I'm, I believe uh, Robert Downey Jr. got paid like 10 or $15 million to literally be in uh, uh, Spider-Man Homecoming for like, t to shoot for 10 minutes or something like that, right? So it's not really a cap, I would say. It's more so like how passionate, how, how much do you love it? And the more you love it, the more you care, the more you give, the more you like, you uh, immerse yourself in it, the sky's the limit, especially at this age, like just, just getting the experience of understanding how the, all this works. Um, and you, yeah, I mean, there's, there's just a huge need. So, so yeah, so that's what I would say. And I think, and, and even not just in film, I mean, there's sports, right? There's live production, there's uh, commercial. There's so many different areas of it too, where like there's people not just in film making the same type of money, right? For And in, 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 in different industries, right? I mean, there, it, it's just so, the thing with, the thing with production is that it's just, it's, it's, it, it, it connects everybody, right? It can connect the whole world. And if you can figure out a way to connect the whole world, then there really isn't a, salary cap right there isn't really like if you if you have the ability to, to help people drive the world in a way and and ex to to feel a certain emotion and they all and they all believe it and, and, and are behind it like that's that in itself there's no there's no it's price it's priceless right so that's kind of how i envision it as far as like whenever someone asks the question like the question of salary or anything like that if that if that answers your question um yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so I also I know for a fact that you have definitely inspired the audience here today. I think you definitely spoke to um, some of these kids because in your uh, passion question, we have kids who are interested in sports, music, dance. I have a feeling that goes hand in hand with your uh, field of work. So. Um, yeah, a lot of kids brains are probably turning right now about how they can incorporate that into what they're currently doing and what they're currently passionate about. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, what are some things that have been challenging along your way? And, you know, how did you overcome those challenges? Yeah, it's a great question. So I wasn't the best in school, right? I wasn't an A student. I wasn't uh, the most focused kid. I was ADHD, um, and 
in that, like I, in my in my upbringing, like there were people close to me. They were like, "Hey, Brilliant, like you should, you shouldn't do film." I've always known that from since I was like younger that I love film, like since I was in high school. Um, and people in that in that in those times were like really like because I mean and you have to think at that time too like I'm just an impression like you all a young person just trying to figure it out even though I, I have this big dream like the last thing I want to hear is someone tell me oh really you shouldn't do that you should do something totally different like even though this is a respectful field but you should be a plumber right like but that's not what I that's not what I'm passionate about right and that's a great career they make great money but that's not what I want to do. But people were, you know, telling me that like I couldn't do that and I should do this whole other thing that I really wasn't, it had no interest in doing, never even had done anything plumbing, but it just was a good career path. And that's what they wanted me to do that. But I, and, 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 and they expected me to listen, but I said, no, like, this is what I want to do. And I kept, and I, instead of me like digging my head, instead of me saying, okay, maybe you're right. I said, no, I'm going to keep pursuing film. I'm going to keep pursuing video. And even though they might say you're not going to make money until you're 40 or 50 or whatever like it's what i love to do and it doesn't sound about the money and um so that was one instance and and struggling with just trying to like to find for me it was finding a group of people that were creative right louisville wasn't really a big creative space for a black creative here that like was young um there wasn't a whole lot of tools right there wasn't production companies that were like all over or organizations I mean that were all over that were giving doing like, doing what we're doing um, and it, it was challenging uh, there I couldn't get there wasn't I was an accessibility to cameras or equipment so in that time instead of me like saying oh well, I can't do it I was like well no I can't shoot well maybe I can write right so I took that time to write scripts to do treatments and so it did, I, in that time I was working more on my story versus the video production the filming because that's all I could do at that time so it's like the, the key to it is just not making an excuse um, and uh, you know I was I had to switch schools my senior year of high school and that was that was unfortunate right but like but for me it's it also allowed me to like I said build that resilience and like build build and see what like what I can do when when I have to, you know, to face on the challenge. I was homeless for when I was in college in Chicago for a week, right? And and I could have easily like, you know, said, you know what, I'm gonna give up on film and X, Y, and Z and and just like not care, but I didn't. You know, I came back to Louisville and went to U of L and went started working with ESPN and that's when really like a lot of things started opening up for me. So it's really like in those moments of like of facing adversity, in those moments of facing like um, you know, obstacle like that's like really that you're that you're like you that you when you whenever you experience something that you're like you have a choice to either accept it or be uncomfortable and do it always go with the be uncomfortable and do it and the reason why i say that is because when i go back to you know when i first went on the film sets when i first when i was in a freshman or, or sophomore in, in a high school when i go back to those weekends i didn't have to go do that after i would get up and i would do it Immediately as I was on set, I would be like, wow, I, this was a huge moment in my life. I didn't have to do this. I could have stayed in my situation, but because I like got up and I just sucked it up and did it, like I put myself in a position that leveled up, right? And that's, that's it's a mindset of like being uncomfortable. Of, like going back to the analogy with the tree. A tree doesn't grow being comfortable. It's, it's hot days it's windy to stormy days it's like you know there's dry days right but you, it's, it's being uncomfortable just like with iron with a sword you know like when you put it in the fire you take it out in the cold like it's that's what makes you stronger and like a lot of people think that it's oh it's it's a lot of people think that you just get success like right away and no like success is not the end goal success is the process of like you finding yourself in this process of like going through obstacles there's always going to be something hard there's always going to be somebody better than you there's always going to be something that's you know like challenging that you're faced with but it's it's how you deal with that issue how you respond not react that really makes the person who's um who's going through that either level up or be in the same situation or or, or not you know so it's 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 not letting your circumstance it's not letting the things around you uh, prevent you from being what you who you want to be your authentic self and when you do that like in five in like five days and a month and like you know six months like you'll see noticeable changes and you'll be seeing like your life move in a direction that is more in line with your dreams right I never dreamed of having this right I, I mean I did kind of but I, I never knew that I could actually do it 
No, by just putting the effort towards it and going towards it, like, you know, like God and allows these things to happen, right? So it's that resilience and just pushing forward and just like, and not giving up no matter what. Awesome. Thank you so much, Freeland. We really appreciate your time and your words. Um, it was great to hear from you, inspiring. And yeah, I think, you know, having that fortitude, that resilience, and you know, when you're faced with a challenge, don't just give up, you know, fight through it, you're going to come out better on the other end of it. So um, thank you so much uh, for being here. And uh, I do want to go ahead and plug a collaborative thing we're doing with Breland. Um, So on November 16th, this event is really designed for you guys. This is for our young adult audience. So this is for our high schoolers, our middle schoolers. Um, we would love to get you guys here at Kentucky Science Center to join us. Um, Breland is going to be sharing a team produced film that he has been involved in, that he has mentored these students through. Um, it will be a group of teen filmmakers who have worked with Roots 101 as well, but it will document younger students learning about the civil rights movement in Louisville, and it'll be a fun time to celebrate their short film, celebrate our teen filmmakers, you get to mingle, explore our uniquely human exhibit, learn more about media production and actually see some of this equipment, maybe have a little opportunity to get on screen and do a little interview. Um, but we would love to have you on the evening of November 16th. That event is really designed for you guys. And we are very fortunate that um, Breland is partnering with us for that and giving us this opportunity to screen it um, on our four story theater. So um, it should be a lovely evening. Uh, the film is called 1963 and we can't wait for it. So mark your calendars, November 16th. So there should be more information on our website soon. And we're really looking forward to it. And we're very grateful for that as well. And, and I appreciate you, and I'm looking forward to this as well. And also, too, like, if you all are interested in more information about that, it will be on our, on our page, as well as if you're interested in uh, being a part of all the other things that we'll be doing, too. Um, you know, you all can sign, scan the code here, see, you know, what we've got going on, see our website, follow us on social, and get involved with the upcoming Storytellers program. Um, and if there's any organizations that are, that are, you know, part of this, like, feel free to reach out, you know, uh, you know, email us at contact at yourmediapros.com. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's that. I, we are excited. We appreciate Kentucky Science Center and, and you, uh, Virginia, for allowing this, you know, allowing us to be a part of this process and talk to you all. And, and we're just excited to see how we can keep moving forward and, and hopefully have you all involved in some of the projects we have coming up with, with Kentucky Science Center and beyond. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Freeland. Thanks for all you do. Um, and now we are going to switch over to our next speaker. Um, so Teresa White is here. Um, she is the executive chef for Dare to Care. Um, we are very excited. We have such a diversity of speakers. So now we're going to hear more about what um, Teresa does for Dare to Care. She's doing some very cool things with STEAM. Um, so I just want to do a quick little uh, intro to chat about that. See where my page is. Oh, here we go. All right. So um, Chef Teresa is a U.S. Army veteran, a parent and a chef. She joined Dare to Care Food Bank in 2017, initially serving in partner development, training agency representatives in food safety, onboarding with the food bank, USD policies, in addition to monitoring agencies for compliance and authoring the Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point Manual for the main warehouse. Before, becoming, uh, before coming to the Dare to Care Food Bank, she was a healthcare chef for more than 15 years and accepted the role of executive chef in the summer of 2020. She now oversees the production for the Kids Cafe Pro Innovation Program, Silver Suppers, RX Meals, and newly approved freeze-dried meals programs. These programs fill a gap for many Kentuckiana families by preparing meals for distribution throughout the network and by preparing and preserving seasonally produced food for future use, dramatically reducing waste. Ms. White holds an associate degree in culinary arts and a bachelor's degree in hospitality management from Sullivan University. Um, so we are very excited to hear about your work and it obviously plays a huge role in the community and we are so thankful for that. So Teresa, I will go ahead and pass it off to you. Thank you, Virginia, I appreciate that. Welcome everybody. Um, so 
I'm really excited to be here. I am a huge advocate for kids in STEM, the younger the better. And I'm excited that you all are a part of this uh, virtual summit where you can learn about so many different aspects of how STEM plays into our everyday world. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started just a little bit. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, Virginia, can you enable that for me? All right, I think I maybe added that feature. You wanna try it? There we go. Uh, so a little bit about my background. As uh, Virginia had mentioned, I'm a United States Army veteran. Uh, when I enlisted in the Army, I was 17 years old because I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with myself. And my parents were both in the military. Um, initially, I thought I would go in as a cook, but my parents said, absolutely not. They wanted me to go into a field where I would have a future. And so I became a military intelligence analyst like my mother. Uh, what this meant was that I was able to program and manipulate satellites. Um, I was able to take pictures from far distances of different things. Um, out in the world in order to help our uh, military leaders make better decisions as to what action should happen next. Um, I deployed twice to Bosnia. I was enlisted in the late 90s. So Bosnia, Middle East, uh, who may have military family members now. Uh, once I got out of the Army, though, the Army said, you are a Unix programmer, which meant that I was qualified to use Unix, a programming language typically used for Medicaid and Medicare servers, various servers that process billions of dollars of revenue on a monthly basis. I did that for about three years, and I really didn't have any passion for that kind of work. Sitting in a cubicle, programming, untangling code, that really wasn't something that I was passionate about. It was a job. And some days I went to work feeling like, if I don't go to work today, what difference does that actually make in the world? I really had to think long, hard about it. And that's when I decided to go back to my original thought of being a cook. And so I went to culinary school um, after I was married, when I had two young children. I really enjoyed culinary school. It really got me into the technical side of cooking. And I learned that I didn't dislike STEM. Um, I just didn't like programming. Uh, so getting into cooking and learning how to cook is all about flavors, but it's also the technical aspect. For example, proteins coagulate at 140 degrees. You have to maintain food safety in order to prevent the growth of bacteria. There's a lot of technical things involved in cooking, and that's really the focus of my, of my talk with you today, is how STEM is involved in a lot of different aspects of our everyday world. For now, I wanna talk a little bit about Dare to Care. Dare to Care Food Bank was started in 1969 when a little boy named Bobby Ellis passed away of malnutrition on Thanksgiving morning. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Families getting ready for this big feast, getting ready to have family and friends come over for really great food, only to learn that somebody in your community, a child, has passed away from starvation. That was the impetus, that was the rallying cry for Dare to Care. A Catholic priest and a rabbi came together and said, this shall never happen in our community again. And they started the very first Dare to Care pantry in the basement of Father Jack Jones's church all those years ago. Every year, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, we hold a candlelight vigil for Bobby in the neighborhood where he lived. Uh, he went to Bick Elementary right here around the corner from my kitchen in the Parkland neighborhood. And every year we celebrate his life and we reaffirm our cause to make sure that nobody uh, suffers from food insecurity in our community. So this is how we work. We get donors, we have teams of people who source donors, who talk face to face, who research grants and find food available for our food bank to receive as a donation. Dare to Care only has three campuses, my kitchen here in the Parkland neighborhood, the warehouse on Fern Valley, and the warehouse on Algonquin Parkway. But we operate for, through over 300 partner agencies. These are places like boys and girls clubs and community centers. These are places like churches and area community ministries and government offices. 
And that is how we serve the hundreds of thousands of Kentuckiana families every single day. Here's our 13 county service network. We serve five counties in Southern Indiana and eight counties around the greater Louisville area. And this year in review is just a little snapshot of everything that we accomplished last year. We served enough food to make up almost 20 million meals for Kentuckiana families. And over a third of that is fresh produce because we know that fresh produce is the healthiest, but it's also the most expensive. The Kids Cafe is where I work here in the kitchen and we produced almost 220,000 meals for school-aged children last year. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, served through 300 pantries. And we also served through school pantries located in elementary, middle, and high schoolers all across our network. And of course, we can't do anything without our volunteers. And we're so grateful for the help that they give us every single day. Here's a little video about our um, about our kitchen here in the Parkland neighborhood. It's pretty simple. Our vision is 100 great Kentucky where everybody has adopted a Today, there was uh, six It's here. So that's here. Six Hey, Teresa, the audio on the video is a little low. Do you think maybe you could mess with a setting or two? Or if you want to unshare and then maybe share again and hit the share audio option, maybe it just needs a little reset. Okay. Okay. Why don't I go ahead and skip that for now? And what I can do is email that to you and we can send that or I can drop the link in the chat if people want to. Was that okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. That sounds great. <clears throat> <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit about our current programs. Our current programs here in the kitchen is our kids cafe. Uh, we've increased the number of kids since 2020 when that video was made. And we're currently serving about 16,000 kids, I'm sorry, 1,600 kids per day right now. When we took over this space in this kitchen, we had the room that we needed to dream big. And the first thing that we did was really start talking to our neighbors to learn how to better serve them. Food banking is run off of an equality model. And what that means is that everybody gets groceries. Everybody gets groceries regardless of how many people are in their household, who's working, who's not, how many kids, uh, how many jobs are being worked by the parent or the adults in the household, uh, whether or not they have transportation or ride the bus. And so with everybody getting food and treating everybody equally, what we weren't doing was treating everybody equitably. When we started having those conversations with our neighbors, we learned that some of our families just don't have the capacity to make full meals out of the groceries that we give them. Maybe instead of one family getting a raw frozen chicken and a big bag of farm fresh green beans, maybe we give another family three pound bags of cooked frozen shredded chicken in a bag. And we give them farm fresh green beans that have been washed and snapped and blanched. Maybe that works out better for that household. But maybe we have another household that's run by a single parent or grandparent with three kids and they're working three jobs and they ride the bus. And that model just doesn't work for them at all. So maybe we offer them that same chicken and those same green beans in a TV dinner, in a meal that they can just 
uh, microwave, pop in the microwave and be able to provide a meal for their families. Uh, so what this means is that we have far less food waste from some of our neighbors who receive food from us, and we're able to serve them in a way that makes more sense to them. Uh, what's really interesting is some of the other feedback that we're getting, such as now that I have microwave meals, I can now help my kids with their homework, or I can now tackle it, an organization project, or I can help my kid with their soccer skills or something. And so those are some extra bits of feedback that we're getting that's really showing the impact that we're having because we're changing the way food banking works by really thinking about our families and how they work and how they live and taking the feedback from them and turning that into viable programming. Our Silver Suppers was born out of those same conversations and these are aimed at our low income seniors. For them though, the gap isn't time, it's capacity. Do they have a car? Do they have the capacity to drive? Can they get to a grocery store? Can they cook for themselves? So now we offer them a menu because there's dignity in being able to choose your own food. Some of those things are heart healthy and some of them are diabetic friendly because we know the issues that our aging population faces. And some things like meatloaf and fried chicken, we're not allowed to take off the menu. I think they'd come for us if we tried. Uh, because again, there's dignity in being able to enjoy the foods that you like. We deliver those meals to their doorsteps for convenience. And again, that feedback's been overwhelming. Here recently, we have begun producing what we call medically tailored meals. Uh, as uh, Virginia mentioned earlier, my background is as a healthcare chef. So I've worked in hospitals and rehab centers, sports nutrition, and really understanding people's health goals and providing food that supports those health goals. So those heart healthy and diabetic friendly meals that we make is just the tip of the iceberg. We also produce renal meals for our kidney patients and prenatal meals for our pregnant mamas, because if we can build healthy mamas, we can build healthy babies. Uh, we've also been accepted into a program run by Harvard called Food is Medicine. And this is a one year intensive program that will teach us how to deal with people with more complex medical issues. For example, if somebody is both got cancer, high blood pressure, diabetes, and renal failure, how do we feed them to support their health goals to keep them healthy and not accidentally feed them something that could counter indicate with their medications or um, negatively impact their health outcomes? I'm really excited about that particular program. I really get into the nerdy side of cooking and food safety, so this is really exciting for me. So what's next? Those other programs are all boots on the ground. They're the ones that are out there in the communities doing the work every single day. So we started really asking more questions of who else are we not serving well? And the answer was our homeless population. For the most part, what we've learned is that somebody living on the street will go about nine blocks away from a known reliable source of food, even if there's better resources two or three miles away. So we decided to really dig in and research ways that we could feed people better. And the answer came to us by way via NASA. So when we combine NASA and food, what do we get? We get freeze dried foods. So I'm really excited about this program. This was a program of two years worth of R&D for me, learning how to keep food safe if we freeze dry it. Freeze drying food or lyophilization is a form of dehydration. Food, frozen food is put into chambers. The chambers are dropped to negative 25 degrees and the whole chamber is placed under pressure. As the temperature is raised, instead of ice melting into liquid water and then evaporating into a gas or a steam, water evaporates directly from a solid state of ice into a vapor without melting into a liquid state at all, which I find kind of fascinating. Uh, when that happens, we're able to keep the nutritional content, the taste, the texture, all of it perfectly intact for when it's rehydrated later. What we learned is that water activity really is the key for keeping food safe. When we turn something that is not shelf stable like meat into something that is, we have to make sure that it is safe because if we let it live on the counter for anywhere from five to 25 years, we need to make sure we're not gonna make people sick when they rehydrate and enjoy that meal later. Water activity is the key. 
we had to drop the water activity below 0.6 in order to inhibit the growth of bacteria, molds, and yeast. And these are the pathogens responsible for making people sick uh, whenever they in, take um, eat food that has been contaminated. Uh, for scale, a saltine cracker is 0.8 water activity. So we had to get everything drier than a cracker in order to make sure that we were keeping people safe. Here are some examples of some common bacteria that cause foodborne illness. Listeria, which typically you find in deli meat or you find in plants like, um, I don't know if you recall, but a few years ago, Bluebell ice cream suffered a listeria outbreak in their ice cream plant. Uh, typically, listeria happens in places where you don't cook the food after it's been produced. It's ready to eat. Uh, and listeria can cause a myriad of health problems uh, if somebody is contaminated with listeria, and it can even cause death. So we have to reduce the water activity below 0.92 to inhibit, the, <laughs> excuse me, inhibit the growth of Staphylococcus aureus or staph, we have to reduce below 0.83. Clostridium botulinum, you typically find goods, you sat below 0.98. And Ascaria e. coli or E. coli, which you normally find in raw ground meat, we had to reduce by before, below 0.94. So we discovered that if we dropped it below 0.6, we pretty much covered all of our bases to make sure everybody stayed safe. So here's some examples that my team and I came up with in the kitchen when we started talking about this summit and the people that might be listening or watching our, our stream today. And this is what we called steam at play. Food science is key. There is so much food science that happens in this kitchen. Some of it happens at the manufacturing level. For example, did you know that it takes a team of food scientists to create new products that are put on the market? So there are food scientists at places like Betty Crocker and Campbell, Yum Brands, KFC, McDonald's. So anytime you see a new product coming out onto the market, a team of food scientists was behind it to make sure that we could reliably package, source, reheat, cook, reconstitute, keep on a shelf for certain periods of time, learning exactly what cooking temperatures and times are needed in order to make that food. IT departments. Um, I have some of the best state-of-the-art equipment in my kitchen currently. I thought it was really exciting three years ago when I got my ovens and they were all touch screens with recipes preloaded into the ovens. When I learned that there was a USB port at the bottom of my oven so I could upload new recipes, my mind was blown. When they updated my software three months ago and I can now email my ovens, what world am I living in? So this is just an example of how IT is also used in a kitchen environment. We also have things like catering software and HACCP software, things like that that help us again keep food safe. My kitchen is a marvel of mechanical engineering. I have a huge hood system that keeps the kitchen cool and comfortable all year round, even when we've got every single oven, stove, and burner going. Uh, it also, it made all of our equipment plug and play, which means if any time I need to upgrade my equipment, it's as simple as unplugging something and plugging something back in. We also have massive amounts of electrical and civil engineering happening here in this building, hooking us into the city, also making sure that our building is to code. It goes without saying that we rely on a lot of nutrition science, particularly for our medically tailored meals. Uh, for example, if we have a patient who's on two grams of sodium all day, that means that they get less than three quarters of a teaspoon of salt in all of their foods. So that is everything, breakfast, lunch, snacks, anything that they're drinking, and we still have to make it taste good. Our nutrition scientists, our registered dietitians are also largely responsible for nutrition education all over our community. Lastly, uh, we have a lot to do with public health. We know that food insecurity plays a big part in key indicators of health and making sure that people have access not just to food, but to healthy food is a reliable indicator of community health. So with all that said, does anybody have any questions for me? I'm trying to be respectful of your time. I know our last one went over just a little bit, so I wanna make sure that I'm respectful of our time and I'm trying to make sure I condense everything in. Thank you so much, Chef Teresa. We really appreciate it. 
Um, I think we can still take a little time for questions. Um, Dr. Zhang will be with you shortly. Uh, so students, attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the Q&A. If you would like to voice your question via mic, you're welcome to raise your hand and we can allow you to talk. Um, but we would love to hear any questions or maybe any thoughts you have after listening to that. Um, I know a lot of times we probably separate science from, you know, things in the community and policies and food security and all that kind of stuff. But there is a lot of science and technology um, that go into that. I mean, learning about kind of that pathology in the food, like that you had to get it down to lower limits so that you could actually um, have kind of store those, preserve them. That's that's something I never would have thought of. But um, it was very cool to learn more about that and that intersection there. All right, so we'll see any questions in the chat or Aw, you've inspired someone to work at a food bank when they get a little older. That's great. Happy to hear that. Uh, people are free to volunteer. If you need food service hours for, say, Beta Club or the National Honor Society, we do track volunteer hours uh, here in the kitchen. Uh, you can go to our website, daretocare.org, and tap on the button that says Get Involved. Uh, and we would love to have you here helping us. Um, we do some veggie prep, some fruit and vegetable prep. Uh, we plate up meals. So there's a lot of ways to get involved all over our, our organization. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, get involved, you guys. Seek out these things. Dare to Care is a great way to get involved. Um, we have a question. What are some of the challenges you face on a daily basis, Chef Teresa? Uh, some of our challenges. We have quite a few. Um, a lot of times it's labor, like right now, today, normally we have anywhere between eight and 10 volunteers every day, and today we just don't have any. That's putting a lot of pressure on the kitchen to get all everything produced and getting everything out the door in a timely manner. Um, some of the other things that we um, are often challenged on too is donations. Uh, we really rely upon donations, especially for our innovation program to make sure that um, uh, we are able to put out as many healthy meals out into the world as is needed. Um, the other thing that we're often challenged by is just learning the things that we don't know. Uh, we really rely on our data am, um, analysts and we really rely on our project managers to help us really learn about what's going on in the community. Uh, for example, about 18 months ago, we learned that one of our agencies, Walnut Street Baptist Church, had sponsored 250 Afghan refugee families. And they asked us to provide four days worth of meals into each one of those apartments while those families kind of got their feet underneath them and then got hooked into more wider resources. And at first, uh, my sous chef and I were talking to each other and we said, you know, we've got tons of food. We will just send all the food. That's fine. And then we really had to start thinking about it and putting ourselves into the shoes of the people that we serve. And this is really an exercise we try to do every day. And uh, we really started talking about what would it be like if we were American refugees fleeing war and violence here in America, and we were fleeing to Afghanistan. Uh, neither one of us speaks the language. We don't read Arabic. Uh, we wouldn't even know where to begin. Um, my oldest son has a lot of food allergies. So I, my main concern would be how do I feed my kid and make sure that he stays healthy? Uh, so we started research, and then we started again talking about how maybe. Now that we're in this place, what are the what is the possibility of us going home anytime soon? We should probably start thinking about this place as our new home and what's going to make us feel welcomed, what's going to make us feel seen. Um, I'm Latina. I come from a large, noisy Mexican family. Uh, what's going to make me feel comforted is probably something like enchiladas, rice and beans. That's what's going to make me feel like somebody saw me and is welcoming me. And uh, Chef Jesse said, yeah, if I've got mac and cheese, I can conquer the world. The same, right? Um, so we started researching Afghan comfort foods and we really leveraged um, the people at UofL, at the International School at UofL to um, learn what an Afghan comfort meal might look like, to get recipes and 
then learn how to convert those recipes and those um, ingredients from uh, Farsi and Pashto into English. Once we made the meals, uh, we also reached out to U of L and we had them translate the label for us again into Farsi and Pashto because we needed to make sure that people knew how to reheat it. They needed to know what was in it. And if there was a mama like me who had a kid like mine, she wanted, she's probably going to want to make sure that whatever she gives her child isn't going to make her child sick. Uh, so those are the challenges, but we see them as opportunities to learn new things, to stretch and to grow and to innovate, uh, to find ways to serve people better. Um, I think that there's a really big stigma around going to a food bank. Uh, people don't want to feel like they're a burden. They don't feel like maybe their troubles are worthwhile. Maybe somebody else needs more than they do. But we want people to feel welcomed and celebrated. We want people to come and have an enjoyable experience. We want people to get what they need so that way they can live a healthy, happy life. They can help their kids with homework and, and they can take care of the things that they need to take care of without the additional burden of where does my next meal come from. Uh, and so that's that's something that we're very passionate about. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, really interesting and cool to think about that cultural and social impact that your work has. Um, so we have quite a few comments, quite a few questions. Um, first off, a lot of people really enjoyed it. So cool, so informative. Um, a lot of people had never considered the science behind that food prep and meeting things like medical and social needs. Uh, so we're very appreciative for that. Um, some questions. Uh, one of our attendees asked if you've ever collaborated or worked with the Ronald McDonald House. Um, we also have a question about how many states have Dare to Care. Um, and then we have a question about the chemistry of cooking and are there different chemicals you can replace when it comes to ingredients? We do not have a relationship, but not that we're not open to that. I think Ronald McDonald is such a massive national nonprofit of its own um, that they have been able to stand alone and purchase food or get food donations for them to be able to support their own foundation. Dare to Care is one of 200 Feeding America food banks. So we cover 13 counties here in Southern Indiana and in Kentucky. But there is a Feeding America food bank that covers every single zip code in the United States. Uh, they're headquartered in Chicago, Illinois, and we are really happy to have our partnership with Feeding America. We're able to leverage those large national donations. Like currently we're working our way through a 56,000 pound donation of whole frozen chicken from our friends at Tyson. And that is just one chunk that was designated for our food bank. Tyson donated millions of pounds of whole frozen chicken to food banks all across the country through Feeding America. Now, the chemistry of cooking. Uh, so yes, there are, uh, I always feel like chemical is a misnomer. Um, water is a chemical. Everything is a chemical. Um, I think what you're talking about maybe is synthetic uh, or synthetically produced chemicals that are used in food. Um, citric acid is a really good example of that. So citric acid is formulated to mimic the properties of things like lemon juice and citrus juices with highest concentrations of acidity. So if your, your recipe calls for citric acid, yes, you can use a lemon juice or something to that effect, but I always recommend that if you're using something that requires a technical level of acidity that you use bottled instead of fresh. Uh, fresh lemons is just like any other fresh produce. Have you ever bit into a carrot and you're like, wow, that is a really carroty carrot or that's a really deeply flavored bell pepper or spicy pepper. And then you get others of the same variety that don't quite have the same new, um, flavor profile, the same punch. Um, you can tell like maybe something's out of season or the texture of the flavor is not quite right. So instead of using fresh lemon juice, I would recommend using a bottle because that is formulated to meet a 5% acidity level. And usually that's really important. Now, if your recipe calls for freshly squeezed lemon juice, by all means, go ahead and use the freshly squeezed. But if it's a technical recipe like for canning or some other type of preservation method, then definitely use the bottle. Um, there are lots of other um, chemicals that can, you can use. Um, for my Muslim, my Jewish, and my Seventh-day Adventist friends, 
And my friends who don't eat pork of any kind, um, instead of using gelatin, you can use a seaweed extract, a synthetic seaweed extract called agar agar. And that provides the same kind of thickening agent um, as gelatin does without being an animal or a pork derivative. Um, and so that's that's another example of some substitutions that can be made. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chef Teresa. We appreciate your time. We appreciate everything we learned. Um, it was really cool to hear about how science comes into play with something that plays such a big role in our community. You guys are really um, extending these great resources and helping with the food, food security here. And we appreciate all you guys do. So thank you so much. You're so welcome. And I dropped the link to that video in the chat for everybody. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, have a great day and we appreciate you joining us. Thank you. All right, everybody. So we are going to switch over to Dr. Zhang. Um, sorry, we're running a little behind here. Thanks for your patience. That's okay. Um, so Dr. Zhang is a professor at U of L in the Department of Geographic and Environmental Sciences. He is uh, also a PhD faculty member of the Urban Planning and Public Affairs and a member of the Center for Integrative Environmental Health Sciences at U of L. Um, he earned his PhD from the University of South Carolina, and he teaches courses including urban geography, population geography, geographic information systems and spatial statistics. Um, he has published extensively on topics ranging from urban crime to housing eviction and from environmental justice to health disparities. So we are very excited to have you here today and to learn more about you know, the importance of STEAM in your work and also how we can extend it to our community. So thank you so much for being here and I will go ahead and hand it off to you. All right. Uh Thanks everyone. Welcome to the Youth Science Summit. Uh, I'm going to share my the PowerPoint. Oh, you have to make me the allow me to share. I couldn't share my PowerPoint now. Okay, just a second. Can you see my PowerPoint now? Yes, we can see it. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Youth Science Summit. I'm a geographer, right? That's kind of why the title of my presentation is about applications of geotechnologies. Basically, that includes uh, like the GPS, remote sensing, GIS, or geographic information systems, because the geotechnologies have been widely applied to almost every field, like from you drive or you travel, right? You're using GPS to get navigation and uh, you, you can use the GPS to do the geocaching, right? And uh, uh, police officers use the GPS, right? To track uh, offenders. Of course, the most widely actually uh, applied area is in the health, public health, right? Today, I'm gonna talk about how geotechnology is being uh, applied in the environmental uh, related health studies. That's actually, pretty much my major research area in the last several years. Uh, a little bit about me, right? I'm, a, I'm trained as a geographer, but geography is a very interdisciplinary, right? Some geographers, they study physical, like a climate, uh, weather, or the mountains, but some study the uh, human socioeconomic, like urban geography, uh, and the health, like a disease, uh, distribution for disease, and spatial patterns, so on and so forth. So basically, uh, the, the kind of uh, advances in the geotechnologies in the last like three decades have made a revolutionary contribution to geography, transforming the geography. Geography is not just the memorizing the, the country capital right, or river, but it's a scientific study. So for, for example, my research right, applied the mapping and geospatial techniques to the study of the environment and health, uh, housing, right, segregation, and the crime and other uh, areas. First, I want to kind of give a brief introduction about the relationship between environment and, and health. Uh, in the recent years, more and more scholars right, and uh, practitioners realize the importance, the, the place and the community, the environment you live in actually play a very important role to your health. So this is about the science, right? How to think about the air you breathe every day, 
the water you drink and the community you commuting pattern right, actually to more or less impact your health. A lot of studies suggest like the, because America is the kind of suburbanized nation, right? Suburban lifestyles is not healthy. If you don't have a sidewalk in your neighborhood, you are less likely to, to, to exercise right, every day. You're more likely to be obese and have some like cardiovascular disease. Uh, so it's kind of really important to take into consideration to study how environment imp impact uh, our health. So that's actually involved, right? Involve the geographical uh, technologies and the knowledge. Uh, especially in the recent years, I mean, not to mention the pandemic just over, right? The, the emerging uh, problems such as the global warming, climate change, uh, and, and the old problems such as the environmental justice, right? And the social uh, disparities, health disparities, all actually call for more studies, right? To actually to study how environment, right? How environment, <clears throat> how do you, technologies can help. As you all know, right? Geography study the, the spatial patterns of physical and human activities on Earth's surface. The modern technologies, uh, like the diagram shows, right? How GPS, remote sensing, they say like imagery and the GIS uh, techniques, right? Uh, allow the scholars, including geographers and, uh, and uh, experts in other fields, right? To collect data, right? Geographic location. That's what called the geographical reference data, right? And to map their patterns, right? To analyze their change, dynamic changes, and investigate uh, the, the relationships, such as crime and, uh, and the neighborhood patterns, health and, uh, and uh, environment. They all put in a geographical framework. The geotechnologies allow you to, to uh, examine the pattern, map them, and uh, to, to investigate how they are interrelated. Uh, the earliest work, right, widely considered the pioneer in geotechnology is Dr. John Snow, who was the, the British, right, British uh, um, epidemiologist or, or geographer, right, studied the outbreak of uh, cholera in 1854 in Soho district of London, actually. Dr. John Snow, he mapped the death of cholera in the Soho district, uh, the illustrated the, uh, like the dots, right, the black dot shows actually the, the death because of the cholera, right? And then also actually, uh, uh, he looked at the street patterns and, uh, and overlaid like uh, the, the water pumps and uh, interestingly enough to find out all oh, the most people, right? The, the, the death tolls uh, the, uh, happened the, near the, the water pump. Actually, that's, that made him kind of relate to, to the kind of the condemnation of water, right? People, after people drinking the dirty water, they got sick, right? Because uh, later, right, scientists realized Cholera is the water ball, right? It's carried, it's transmitted by, by the water. Back then, we don't have a clean water, no clean sewage, right? That's the problem. So this is kind of a, how mapping the distribution, mapping the spatial pattern can help us solve the problem, right? He quickly suggested the city to shut down, right? Remove the handle of the water pump, actually. The, the outbreak quickly disappeared. Uh, so modern technology, definitely geotechnology, are more kind of widespread, more the in depth. Uh, especially like for example, you can every day the first step, right? You do research, you study the uh, think about the the uh, any type of disease or public health problems. You collect data, right? You recruit people. You want to get a location uh, because we know, right? What kind of community location matters? Spatial sampling. That's first one. The second one, once you collect the data, right? Uh, the geotechnologies allow you to map them, to analyze any type of pattern, to identify hotspots, cold spots. Um, hot spots means areas tend to be much, much higher, right? Incidence rate than the average of your community. Also, uh, that will allow you to actually examine the associations between uh, environmental factors such as exposure to pollution or exposure to uh, to heavy metals, such as lead poisoning, right, and might uh, cause uh, health problems, right. Uh, of course, this kind of involves the uh, applications for advanced uh, spatial statistical uh, methods to try to uh, to find the, the house spots, right. Uh, of uh, and uh, all this is kind of for the purpose or is to 
promote health equity, right? To pursue environmental justice because we live in a world, right? That the inequity and uh, injustice, right? That's need how the scholars, right? And uh, researchers, uh, anybody, right? Individuals, right? Involved to research, right? Related to try to build a, a better society, a more equity society, country, nation, and uh, get uh, environmental justice and social justice. Uh, so the, this is kind of really very, very basic. You want to use the kind of geotechnology that you want to understand, right? The basic kind of level, geographical level, uh, uh, you, you want to co collect, right? You want to collect, you want to analyze. So you can, you can uh, integrate the environmental data with the socioeconomic, with the health, uh, all the comes. Uh, so uh, uh, this diagram shows actually how the, the Census Bureau actually, they build a geographical hierarchy uh, from the very top, that's national level, but you can do regional level, break it down, uh, division states, or 3,000 counties. Uh, actually, the, in the bottom, the three small levels, right? The census tracts, block group, and the blocks are kind of a small geographic areas, which are really helpful for doing the health-related study and other type of uh, uh, research, right? Uh, so this is the, actually a map showing the, the three levels, the geographical boundaries in the Louisville, uh, Jefferson County uh, area. Actually, you will see like the dark, uh, the thick dark boundary shows the census tract, right? Which is just pretty much equivalent to a neighborhood, right? And most time we say neighborhood level study, that actually the data, right? The socioeconomic data or the health data, we can aggregate it. Right, or summarize to the census track because of confidentiality. A lot of times the individual right, uh, patient level data, right, individual level, the household level data are, 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 are not allowed right, to, be, to be released right, because we, we were concerned about their privacy, right, confidentiality. So that's why geography, right? When you aggregate the data to, to geographical areas such as census track, blog group, you can, it's more likely for you to identify pattern, right? Uh, or geographical, uh, disparities. Uh, this is an example of how CDC, the Center for Disease Control and the Prevention, uh, they have a database called the Places. Actually, they actually get the data all the, uh, for the uh, for cities, right, municipalities, census tracts, zip code, right, uh, and, and other counties, right, including the different type of variables from health outcomes to uh, behavioral patterns and the uh, environment, so on and, uh, and so forth. Uh, this is actually the, uh, you can visit the website that uh, created by CDC places. Actually, you can look at the, uh, visualize, right? You can online, look at this online map to see the distribution pattern, uh, not only just by counties, but also you can zoom in further to see the details, right? Inside Jefferson County, inside Boley County, you see differences, right? Because we know, right, from neighborhood to neighborhood, the socioeconomic patterns are very, very different. Health, uh, Health disparities exist, right, inside the counties. That's why it's important, right, to actually use the small geographical areas to do health-related studies. So basically, today's lecture, uh, the, the presentation, I'm going to focus on two things: how the why uh, geography matters, how geotechnologies play an important role in climate change uh, and uh, and the environmental justice. We are facing. Uh, uh, burning challenges because global warming, climate change, right? However, actually, when you actually look at the disaggregated data, right? Look at the uh, look at the breakdowns by race, ethnicity. You will see we we living on the same same planet, but actually different communities, right? Different part of the nation, they face different challenges in terms of the climate change, in terms of global warming. Therefore, actually, the uh, you can identify probably more uh, health disparities. For example, right, if for the, the diagram on the top shows like a two degree global warming happens average, uh, like for the for the globe or for nation, uh, but actually different type of uh, ethnicities, they face uh, uh, different uh, challenges. So the minority of the low income communities are more, they facing more because they live in communities, they don't have many trees, right? They have a more severe urban heat island. The temperature is much, much higher. Some of the latest research, they suggest indicated that like the Hispanic, African-Americans, they face like a several degrees higher in the same day, right? Same day, uh, I mean, the, because the environment, right? The communities they live in are different. So the climate change can be related to like a 
uh, extreme temperature, severe thunderstorms and uh, flooding, tornadoes, so on and so forth. Uh, really, the, the low income and the minority, more disadvantaged communities, they face more, uh, they're more vulnerable actually in front of global warming or climate change. Uh, this is a, a study published in the top journal, Nature uh, uh, Communication. Actually, this is the kind of look at the uh, in the in urban areas, right? In urban areas in Baltimore, uh, city of Baltimore, Maryland. Actually, you see the the map show a different type of neighborhood, like right? blacks, the uh, Hispanics, right? Are disproportionately uh, exposed to urban heat island because think about urban areas; they have too much. Uh, impervious land, concrete as forth, right? During daytime, the, the temperature rises very, very quickly, right? Very, very quickly, which made the, the ambient temperature in their community much, much higher. So look at the map, you see the, the dark red areas, that's basically the inner city neighborhood, disproportionately represented by the Hispanic, by the low income uh, household. Therefore, they face more, think about, right? More, the, uh, more problems, they're more vulnerable disproportionate exposure, right? much, much higher than the suburban, right? The suburban areas, which are dominated by middle class, right? wealthy families. Uh, specifically, uh, if you're interested in the kind of urban heat island, this is definitely a big issue, right? Several years ago, uh, uh, Georgia Tech uh, uh, scholars, they did a national study. They ranked Louisville very, very on the top, actually. Louisville, because Louisville is highly segregated right? among, the, among the cities nationwide. So you see the, the big map on the left hand side shows actually this is the uh, this is actually a study studying the urban heat island to 2021. You you can check actually you can zoom into any uh, urban areas metropolitan area to see how the urban heat island right impact the different neighborhood. Uh, uh, so on the right hand side you see actually this is for Louisville. Zoom into Louisville. Look at the legend, it shows, see the red color shows the positive much higher. That means much higher than the average, right? A average for the community. Look at the West End, right? West End of Louisville, it could be like a, as high as a five degree, right? Higher than the average. Right? And the suburban area, much, much cooler, more comfortable, right? Therefore, you're less likely to be affected by the severe, uh, no, the, the, the extreme temperature, right? That's what, how the, and besides, if you relate to the historical, the uh, structure racism, redlining, right, dis discrimination, segregation, actually basically the West Bank still, they bear the burden of uh, the historical discrimination and the legacy. Right? Uh, my colleagues, my colleagues actually uh, last, uh, last summer, yeah, last summer, they did some of the kind of field study. They look at the, they actually use the drone, right, or the, uh, on main aircraft system to get a, get a actually the pictures and get a simulation of temperature actually for the for downtown Louisville. Uh, this is the actual the Founders Square Park. The the map the temperature shows the simulation actually. Uh, this is very interesting, very helpful actually for the for the for the health right the uh, scholars right the, uh, the the doctors right to actually evaluate right to evaluate how the how the temperature, urban heat island, might impact, right? Impact people's health. All right, not only kind of, uh, if uh, climate change, right? Uh, global warming is kind of relatively new, but environmental justice is not new, right? It's an old topic, right? For long times, historically, uh, minorities, uh, low-income communities have been disproportionately located or distributed in communities very close, right? Very close to to, to polluting facilities, toxic release, right? Facilities uh, that the EPA identified, they are more vulnerable, right? They have limited choices, right? They, they don't have a economic uh, uh, feasibility to relocate, to move to the suburbs, to to uh, to get a, to live in an environment, right? Much better. So that's what the environmental just, justice is about, right? This is actually it's environmental injustice. We want to change, right? We want to promote uh, environmental justice, change the, the injustice. So this is actually the look at the study, right? Uh, uh, it shows how the different uh, part of the uh, metro or city, right? You see actually the uh, the residents living in poverty, residents living in black, right? Uh, uh, 
Therefore, we have actually, we, we, we actually face different levels of exposure, right? Exposure to the air pollution, to the, to the toxic uh, particular matter releases from these uh, uh, facilities. Uh, for my own research, actually, last started from last summer and today, this year we're still working on that. We look actually, we get the data for the blood lead level from Louisville Metro Health Department, actually. And then we overlay the data for the for the polluting facilities. Look at the map, the, the, the dots shows polluting facilities, like chemical, uh, chemical factories, power plants in, in Louisville areas. And overlay the red lining, right? Because 1930s, FHA, Federal Housing Administration, actually, they allow mortgage, right? Mortgage companies to draw, use the red mark to highlight a poor co community, poor neighborhood, and reject their application for mortgage, right? When they want to buy a house, right? And so that's what his red, red lining is about. But still, the legacy is still persistent, right? Persistent, actually. Nowadays, the West Louisville is still. Kind of, they have the highest poverty level, right? They have the highest exposure to uh, pollution, right? Robert Hall, actually, the industrial com complex in the West Louisville, some of you might know. So, uh, this is actually, uh, we want, we try to relate to the now the recent data, right? The contemporary data, children, right? Children living in the different parts of Jefferson County, we want to look at the, how their blood level uh, might be related to the exposure right or their proximity to to polluting facilities in the in west end so this is the map actually shows how we're doing the field data collection we went to the uh, abandoned properties uh, for, provided by the louisville health uh, department so we actually collect location data right and also we collect data for soil and the paint in terms of lead right lead concentration we're going to send the data to labs right, to see how how elevated right level the lead poisoning, the lead data in soil and the and the paint. Right? Most likely, if you live in homes built before 1950s, more likely called the paint. Right? Back then, what well, contains uh, lead, and also in the soil. Right? We're also gonna get data for the for the air pollution. Right? From the EPA's database, so we can we can relate all these data, environmental data, with the uh, blood level lead poisoning in children's blood. So that's to see how the how we can we can, uh, I mean, the understand better about the severity of the problems and uh, how to, how uh, policies can make changes right, to reduce reduce lead poisoning. Uh, another projects are being involved in. Uh, we published uh, uh, studies in the academic journals. Uh, this one was funded by the National Institute for Health. Uh, I collaborated with Dr. Zeroy, who is an epidemiologist in public health. We, we try to understand and investigate how the two coal-fired power plants on the river in west uh, part of Jefferson County, uh, Cane Run and uh, Mill Creek, actually, because they not only actually emit the, uh, you know, uh, actually the, the smoke, right, cause air pollution, but also they have the coal ash burn the leftover, right, the piled in the storage facilities nearby. That's also caused problem, environmental problem. So the residents, especially the children who live in the nearby neighborhood, are uh, more likely to uh, be exposed to kind of uh, air pollution to the uh, to the heavy metals as containing the coal ash, you know, you can call it all fly ash. Uh, so that's basically there. Therefore, the children's neural behavioral performance will be uh, obstructed. So that's kind of another. Also, it's kind of community-based study. Uh, Expanding to, to statewide, right? Statewide also actually I did research to try to uh, reveal uh, racial disparities in proximity to uh, TRI uh, facilities in Kentucky. The big map shows the actual locations where the, uh, the factories, right? The polluting facility located. And uh, the demographic data, right? The percentage of population uh, in each census tract or community Neighborhood that is black actually with the highlight, especially if you zoom into Louisville and Lexington, the two largest metro urban areas, you will see actually. Uh, we use the location caution, which is to show how like uh, how many times right the blacks or uh, other type of minorities are more likely right to be uh, to live in a neighborhood close to the polluting facilities than the than the the, the county average or the state average. 
obviously we have multiple times, right? Four times, seven times, even 11, like almost 12 times, right? More likely which is, uh, uh, to live close, right? Close to the facility. Uh, I, actually, we get a more accurate data because EPA use a, use models, right? Use the geostatistical models actually to estimate the concentration of uh, pollution, right? Uh, pollutant emitted from the TRI facilities, right? how this spread this disperse to affect nearby uh, communities. So the the coroplast map or color shading map shows actually the concentration. So this is for lead only, right? Lead, lead with heavy metal toxic, right? Uh, not only, right? Not only in the soil, in the paint, but also from the air, because these factories are still operating. They just uh, release tons, right? Tons of uh, uh, toxic metals, including lead, arsenic, uh, cadmium, right? Mercury, you name it, right? So this basically look look how the different part, different communities, right? Uh, think about especially in the western uh, part of the state, right? You get a you uh, Owensboro area, Sporting Green areas, of course, Louisville area, and uh, and Lexington, South Lexington, they have much much higher, much much higher. This is a problem, right? Many people don't realize, right? They're not even aware of that, actually. Uh, this problem. Uh, so the. Uh, I also actually did research to study how the community environment uh, plays matters right to people's health from a geographical perspective using maps right using spatial uh, geospatial techniques. Uh, some of you might have heard of the term called the diabetes belt in the U.S. This nation, basically, the, uh, like the early study right by Barker right uh, in 2011, they identified like a uh, diabetes belt in the southeastern part, uh, actually, basically, basically along the Appalachian Mountain regions, including Kentucky. Many counties are located uh, in Kentucky are located in the Appalachian Mountain uh, region. So, early study identified the diabetes belt, and now I just use the most recent data, right, re released in the 2022 to look at the how how the communities, right, how the communities in the in in Kentucky, this is actually a much smaller unit with then counties where we look actually uh, the census tract level data, which allow us right, to look at the uh, within county disparities. Especially, right, it's, it's very striking. You see the uh, the counties, communities right in the eastern part of the state, and um, of course there's some other places, right, like a west end of Louisville. Right, this is a kind of a, they all have much much higher. Uh, diabetes incidence rate, right? Even this is based on the most recent data collected by CBC, right? CBC. Uh, uh, I actually, I just get a new new uh, grant participate the uh, collaborating with Dr. Egger with a uh, with a doctor in the medical school, right? We try to uh, study like the uh, how rural uh, environment, right? Because Kentucky is the it's very rural, right? or less than 60% of Kentucky's population live in the cities, right? We are actually much lower than the national average in terms of urbanization. So therefore, actually rural, uh, rural residents, right? Especially in the Eastern uh, Kentucky and the Western Kentucky, people face the uh, obstacles. They have very limited accessibility to, to health facilities, right? To see doctors, to get a, to get a cancer screening, right? So therefore, actually, we try to address this kind of rural uh, obstacles, why geography matters, right? To actually investigate, investigate the disparities, right? In the uh, colorectal cancer right, and other types of cancers in the uh, in, in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, this uh, this map shows actually I, I overlaid the hospitals, right? Because basically. You know, most hospitals are located in the densely populated, right, urban area or metropolitan areas. And many, some counties or rural communities, they have, they barely have any, right, facilities available. So therefore, uh, oftentimes the residents, right, once they diagnose the cancer, it's too too late, right. So therefore, we, we our research could have provided insight right, to policies, to the public health practices, to try to provide more. Uh, kind of uh, early screening uh, facilities to help the residents who live in a uh, ru very rural area of the state. 
All right, this I think this is the uh, this is the uh, a study actually we try to do in the future, right? We try to get a funding from NIH. Actually, uh, continue with the early study we did for Louisville, the power plants, right? And actually, we try to investigate, right? The coal-fired power plants and uh, uh, and the birth defects, right? Birth defects is the big issue in this country, uh, like three uh, percent, right? For newborn babies uh, have uh, some kind of uh, birth defects. And the research suggests birth defects is uh, uh, correlated or associated with the pollution, air pollution, especially uh, with the uh, power plants burning coal, right? Burning coal. Although the, now we, we try to kind of retire or re replace coal burning by uh, natural gas or uh, more clean technology, clean energy, but actually coal fired power plants still produce like one third of the electricity. Nationwide, so this is nationwide problems. Uh, so exposure to pollution and uh, high risk for birth defects and other type of uh, uh, disease or public health problems is definitely a, a, a big issue. Right? We try, this map actually shows how the uh, we did some preliminary uh, analysis to show how uh, locations of uh, power plants burning coal are uh, associated with the high prevalence rates of, uh, of birth defects. Uh, so actually, it's, it's very clear, right? I, I calculated that you see that we use the GIS to get the uh, get average of birth defects prevalence, uh, mid comparisons, right? You closer, if you live closer to, uh, to coal power plants, and uh, we compare with the nearby and the far away, right? Far away. You live closer, you have much higher, right? Much higher. It's it's we use different distance buffers, right? It's it's all consistent, right? Consistent, which indicated, right? Indicate high risk, right? Indicating the the severe problems, right? Caused by uh, might be related, right? Related to power plants. Of course, many other studies, right? Researchers, right? They did uh, uh, the point out. Uh, actually, look at the, this one. Shows the kinds of areas, right? Many places across the country. We call it cancer valley, right? Like uh, the, 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 most likely they they are very close, right? They were, these communities near the uh, polluting facilities, uh, chemical, right? Power plants, right? The uh, another type of heavy industries. All right, this is kind of basically this is the, my kind of research experience. What I did, right? I want to basically share my my research to with you to try to inspire you guys to, to be interested in the do research or especially probably for the next when you uh, apply to your college, right? Choose a major and, uh, and think about the, your future career, right? And uh, what I want to say that is like a geography, right? Geography, geotechnologies are really important. And the health, environmental health research definitely need the geotechnologies need the participation. Uh, we need an interdisciplinary team right, to tackle uh, climate change, right, uh, global warming, right, environmental justice, uh, urban heat island, these type of uh, problems uh, to understand right, to, uh, why environment uh, plays so important a role. Right? Uh, this is my, my reference. Uh, I want to, uh, at the end, I want to promote my department, my UFL. The geography department, uh, the name of the department changed to Geographic and Environmental Sciences to better address the issues, what we teach, what we study actually. And uh, uh, our, our graduates were actually, uh, once they, 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 they graduate from our department, or oh, some of them still need just like a, took some uh, GIS classes or geotechnologies, it's, they, they, were, they become more competitive in the job market. Right? Uh, so. Uh, this, uh, by the way, the number of years ago, Dr. Bleach, well-known geographer, published a book, Why Geography Matters. One big issue is about climate change, right? So, job, so many people, including educated scholars, they might think geography is just like the uh, memorization of, a, of a, uh, country capital. That's not true, that's not So Many people have limited geographic knowledge uh, the actually the geotechnologies are very very powerful. Right. Thank you very much. Any questions?
All right. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and you sharing this with us. It was so cool to learn about how we can apply this kind of steam um, and how big of a societal and cultural impact that has. You know, thinking about environmental injustice and how there is data we can collect that helps us analyze those situations, predict those kind of situations, and actually inform policy decisions. So yeah. very cool. Thank you very much. Um, we have a, a quick question, and then I think we'll pop over to Dr. Faruqi. Dr. Faruqi will be with you very shortly. Um, so you mentioned um, Oak Ridge, and uh, we had a student who asked, does that mean Oak Ridge has much higher rates of birth, dis birth defects? Uh, Oak Ridge, let me see, well, let me see what that. Oh, uh, actually, you know, basically the project we're working on about how the, actually, if you live nearby a power plant, coal-fired power plant, uh, you more likely uh, kind of uh, have a public health problem or more likely to be diagnosed with kind of a disease, including the birth defects. Uh, let me see. So I'm not sure the, if I understand the question correctly. Let me see. I don't why oh, I couldn't see the chat previews. Okay. So any any other questions? It looks like that's it for now. If you guys do think of additional questions, um, feel free to post them and I can pass them along as well. Um, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Zane. We really appreciate it. Um, very cool and a, a different application of STEAM, I think a lot of us probably haven't thought of and how it contributes to our community. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, very yeah. cool society. So thank you. We appreciate your time. Um, have a great day. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. All right, you guys. So we are going to pop over to our last speaker for the day. Um, we have Dr. Faruqi joining us. Hello, Dr. Faruqi. Thanks for being here. I'm just going to give you a quick little introduction. Um, so Dr. Ali Faruqi is a private practice psychiatrist at Integrative Psychiatry in Louisville and is a clinical faculty at the University of Louisville Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, where he's involved in research, teaching doctors and medical students. Um, he is also the psychiatrist for the Louisville Metro Department of Corrections. His practice focuses on the treatment of mental illness with the use of medications, therapy, and interventional, inter, interventional approaches such as brain stimulation and infusions. Um, he attended college and medical school, medical school at the University of Kentucky. He holds leadership positions in multiple national organizations, such as the National Network of Depression Centers, the American Psychiatric Association, and the Clinical Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation Society, as well as in regional professional and community organizations, such as the Kentucky Medical Association, Kentucky Psychiatric Medical Association, Southern Psychiatric Association, Greater Louisville Medical Society, and the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, so we are gonna hang around a little longer since we got behind. So if you can stick around with us, we would love for you to. Um, I'm very excited to hear from Dr. Faruqi and I think he has some really inspiring, um, cool and conversational things to talk with us about. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to you. Uh, thank you for being here today. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, welcome uh, to all of you guys that are here in attendance today. Um, my understanding is that you guys are in, uh, I think, middle school and high school, and uh, and also my understanding is that you're interested in uh, STEAM type uh, professions, so you know, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And uh, you know, I think that medicine is probably the coolest of all the possible career choices. I'm very biased when I say that because I am a doctor, and so I have a uh, you know, I have a vested interest in uh, advocating for my uh, for my profession. Um, 
instead of focusing directly on what I do day to day, I wanted to kind of inform you guys about the route uh, and the things that uh, you have to do to get to where I'm at. The uh, uh, you know I'm, I'm by no means towards the uh, end of my career, so I'm still kind of early on, um, and I'm still building and developing. Um, so I, I think that you guys will. Uh, I think that I what I share with you guys is going to be uh, useful. So uh, after you finish high school, um, you are going to, uh, in order to be a physician, the next step would be to go to college or to get a undergraduate degree. The cool thing about medicine is that it, it doesn't really matter what you decide to major in in college. There are certain requirements that you have to take in terms of classes in order for you to be uh, to meet the criteria for medical school, and you have to take a medical school entrance examination called the MCAT, M-C-A-T. Um, medical school, there's different types of medical school. They have, in the United States, we have two main degrees that are roughly equivalent, and most hospitals and most, uh, most folks uh, consider both of these degrees to be medical doctors, and that's the MD, which is a medical doctorate, and the DO, which is the doctor of osteopathy. So those are both graduate doctorate level degrees. So you do undergrad, and then you get admission into either an MD school or a DO school. That school is four years. So it's four additional years after four years of undergrad. But when you finish, you are a doctor, and then you apply for training or internship. Um, training is, uh, it's, uh, it's called residency. It's called internship. There's a, a number of different, uh, different, uh, names for it, but that's kind of where you, uh, learn how to be a specific kind of specialist. So most people, when they finish med school, you're a doctor, but you don't, you're not specialized. You're not a surgeon versus a psychiatrist versus a neurologist versus a pediatrician versus your family medicine doctor. You don't have that specialty yet. You have to go through specialized training to be able to do that. And, and that ranges in terms of how long you do the training for. And then once you finish with your training, then you're a fully fledged doctor and you're able to... Uh, practice independently and do the type of things that uh, that we uh, do, which is, you know, usually treating patients and, uh, you know, some, some of us teach, some of us do research. Uh, I love medicine. And I think that being a physician is probably the, the most versatile and widely applicable degrees that you can do. Uh, doctors are, are not just uh, uh, involved in treatment. You know, as a physician, uh, you can actually uh, teach other doctors and medical students. You can see patients. Uh, you can just do research. Uh, you can be involved within companies, uh, biotech companies and technology companies, et cetera, and uh, work towards promoting that level of uh, innovation in the field. Uh, you could also be involved in the corporate ladder and you could join a pharmaceutical company, an insurance company, or other types of uh, areas and not even practice medicine. You can have that educational background and apply that towards business and finance. Um, you could also uh, choose to ignore all that stuff and go into politics and work within local, state, and federal policies. There's been Throughout the years, numerous physicians that have run for office and won. I think one of our uh, one of our senators actually was in uh, was a physician uh, as well for the state of Kentucky, and so it's a very widely applicable uh, uh, area of study. And I think one of the reasons why uh, medicine attracts so many individuals and why a lot of individuals that practice medicine are able to do these different things is because we are actually, uh, medical school teaches you not only how to treat patients, but it also teaches us how to think about problems in a different way. It really highlights uh, your ability to problem solve, to look at a, at a situation, think outside the box and inside the box, uh, be able to think you know, systematically, organize uh, your problem solving skills to really solve a problem. And in that way, uh, and, and, to, and to do that, we apply the principles that we pick up along the way with different uh, uh, areas that you've learned about today through you know, the, the, the lectures and the talks that you've had. Um, 
the cool thing is that we also utilize a lot of different uh, skill sets. And so, you know, you have to know a little bit of physics, you have to be a little bit artistic, you got to know a little bit of math, you got to know a lot of science, you got to know a lot of medicine. And so we were able to combine these different interests and different avenues and this diverse uh, way of thinking and really just consolidate that and uh, it to do what we want to do. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what I do. So uh, I went to medical school. I went to high school in Kentucky. I went to London, Kentucky where, uh, for high school. Uh, I graduated. Then I went to college at the University of Kentucky. So I'm a wildcat, uh, but Kentucky guy. Uh, I went to the University of Kentucky for undergrad. And I went to the University of Kentucky for a medical school. Um, when I left medical school, and this is going to be uh, just a, uh, th this is going to like pretty much uh, it's a proof of concept of what I was just uh, was talking about. So when I left medical school, uh, I did neurosurgery in Missouri. So I was a brain surgeon for a little while. Uh, I did a lot of research in the in that uh, area. I left to do finance at a uh, investment firm in Chicago at Aerial Investments. So I was uh, there for a little while, uh, and then I went into business and administration uh, and ran urgent care companies. Uh, an urgent care company. We oversaw numerous urgent care centers in uh, a few different states uh, for a little while, and I missed treating patients and I missed patient care. So I came back and instead of uh, doing brain surgeries again, I got recruited into psychiatry. And so now I deliver mental health care in, uh, in Louisville um, at a private practice where I'm a partner. Um, I'm also uh, affiliated with the University of Louisville uh, School of Medicine and the University of Louisville Depression Center. Um, we are, uh, you know, I, I teach other medical students, uh, so folks that have finished undergrad and gotten their bachelor's of science and are now in medical school. Uh, I also teach resident physicians, which are individuals that uh, uh, have gone through medical school and are currently receiving specialized training in psychiatry. Uh, so I teach psychiatry residents, medical students, um, and uh, I also give lectures to a lot of different uh, community organizations, et cetera, because I think that, and you, I think you guys will all agree that over the course of the last few years, uh, mental health care has become quite, uh, uh, it's, been, it's been in the spotlight a little bit. I think that we are all dealing with the repercussions of not only COVID, but of decades of ignoring our mental health. And so th as a result of that, you know, unfortunately, we have a very high burden of illness, but fortunately, we have a uh, a kind of a uh, folks are more open to talking about it, and people are more open to seeking treatment and uh, and advocating for their health, not just their physical body health, but also their brain health as well. And so, I want to talk about brain health, to you guys, and hopefully inspire some of you some of you guys are in high school and in middle school to uh, going towards the neurosciences. So uh, psychiatric disorders or uh, mental health diagnoses, mental health problems are really brain problems, okay? So they're brain problems that have, uh, that present themselves in behaviors and in feelings. And as, and but us doctors are specialized in trying to figure out whether that what's going on with an individual is it is it because of something that's normal human emotion. It is normal for people to feel sad. It is normal for people to feel happy. It is normal for people to uh, feel angry. It is normal for people to have very strong emotions. Um, but. Uh, but when those emotions become so unregulated that it interferes with your life, or when those emotions uh, don't really make sense in the context of what's going on uh, in your life, or if the behaviors around those emotions are interfering with your life or the life of your loved ones or your family or society, uh, then, then the question comes up, like, are these emotions uh, and things like that, are they are they pathological? Are they because of a brain disorder and outside the realm of what we as humans do experience and should experience? And our training allows for us to make that 
deter determine that difference. Our training allows for us to recognize whether what you're going through is something that I need to support you and advocate for you and, you know, maybe uh, do therapy for uh, with a therapist or with, you know, with a doctor or, or somebody else, or whether this is something that I need to intervene on. This is something that I need to actually, you know, act like a physician and treat with medications or other types of approaches. Mental health care has come a long way. And by the time that you guys finish high school and go to college, and if you decide to go down this road, I'm sure that what I'm talking about is going to be like ancient history and, and you guys will have much newer, cooler things that you can do. But right now, uh, the way that we treat mental health care, uh, mental health is really in three general uh, uh, categories, okay? Category number one to treat mental health is therapy. Um, which is which is trying to under which which essentially is trying to understand the thought processes and pathways that we have developed over time and trying to kind of uh, hijack them, trying to hack into them and adjust and change the way that we approach problems that we uh, approach behaviors. The therapy is is excellent. Uh, in certain types of uh, mental health disorders or psychiatric disorders like anxiety, therapy works as well as medication does. Uh, but it might be a little bit slow. It might be a little bit time consuming. It might require, uh, you know, a little bit of effort on, uh, on the part of both the person doing the therapy and the person receiving it. And uh, the second way that we treat uh, disorders is through medication. We know that Illness is because of a change in the body's normal functioning. Medications try to adjust the body and the brain's functioning to treat symptoms that people are uh, experiencing. So, so that symptom could be, you know, depression. It could be psychosis like schizophrenia. It could be bipolar disorder where you have a lot of ups and a lot of downs at various time intervals, uh, which interfere with your daily functioning and your ability to succeed in the things that you want to succeed in. Um, and so the medications help restore normal brain functioning uh, and normal brain physiology. And it helps restore uh, you and allow for you to live your life the way that you want to. A very common uh, type of disorder that we would treat, uh, which some of you might be familiar with is ADHD, uh, which is a, uh, uh, which is a, a, a change in the way that the brain processes information. And so we have medications that help people function to the best of their abilities and really meet their potential. And that's such a cool thing that we're able to do with some of the treatments that we have. The third way that we treat individuals is through what we call psychiatric interventions and or, uh, or interventional psychiatry. Now, this is something that is fairly new. This area of the of medicine has uh, come about in about the last 10 years. Our practice did some of the initial clinical trials or studies that helped uh, uh, brain stimulation take, take root in the United States. And we were involved in a lot of the studies that actually resulted in a widespread approval uh, of this of these uh, uh, types of uh, treatments. So I want to talk about that in a little bit more detail. And I know we're over time, and I know you guys had a long day, so I'm not going to spend too much time belaboring you with uh, with the nuances and the details of what that is. But I want to give you a taste of what's possible uh, for you to do. Um, and so, uh, so this is, uh, can everybody see this? I think you guys can see this. So, uh, so essentially this is our, um, th that's my practice. It's called integrative psychiatry. We are, like I mentioned, associated with the University of Louisville School of Medicine and the Depression Center. And so I mentioned medication. It's not, yeah, you know, I can show you a, a picture of a, of a pill bottle or prescription pad. You guys have all seen it. I'm not going to waste your time with that. But what I, you might not have seen is this thing right here. So. In my practice, we use these machines, which are called TMS machines or transcranial magnetic stimulation. And I want you guys to think of this machine as a personal trainer for the brain. So we have done, we in the medical community have done uh, studies where we looked at pictures of your brain. And I can look at your brain when it's 
depressed. I can look at your brain when it's not depressed. And I can measure how blood is flowing in your brain when you're depressed and when you're not depressed. And when we do this over you know, hundreds of patients, what we find is that there's certain areas of your brain that when you have a mental illness, that they're not functioning the way that they need to function. And there are a couple different ways that we can fix that abnormality. We can prescribe a medicine for it, but you know, a medicine uh, might have side effects. A medicine might not work. It might not be specific to you because it's a, it's a, a medicines are meant to apply to a general population. The other thing that I could do is me is I can maybe go to that area of the brain that's not working right, and I can stimulate it. I can uh, I can go to it and like a personal trainer kind of force it to do certain reps so it builds up that uh, it, it gets used to firing the way it's supposed to fire, and that's what this machine does. So we have we, you can see the chair there. It's a very comfortable chair. Uh, we have folks sit in that chair, and while they're sitting there, they can watch TV, they can watch Netflix, they can kind of play on their phone, listen to music, take a little nap, you know, whatever you want to do. And what we do is use the a magnet to force the brain to fire. Uh, when, while this is going on, you might feel a tap on your head, but you're not really going to feel uh, any other abnormal sensation that's going to disrupt you. We have some folks that just talk to our, uh, our TMS techs or to their doctors while they're getting the treatment, and they just sit there peacefully receiving their treatment. The, uh, this is the, another view of our uh, chair. And so, as you can see, this, uh, you know, it's a very comfortable chair. You can recline. Uh, we have a camera here that detects the positioning. And when you sit here for the first time, what we do is we map your brain and we try to determine where the different parts of your brain are, uh, the different areas of your brain are that do the different things. We can find the area that makes your foot twitch. We can find the area that makes your hand twitch. And based on those areas, we can find the the centers that are uh, uh, that are responsible for depression, the areas that are responsible for anxiety. We can find the areas that are responsible for executive functioning or thinking or cognition, and we can stimulate those areas to help reduce uh, the symptoms that someone is experiencing and help them improve. Uh, in terms of their depression or anxiety or other things. This is another view of this. And this uh, right there is what's called our magnet. Um, electromagnetism is pretty cool. Uh, it was invented a long time ago. And essentially what, uh, what it means for those of you guys who are in physics, I'll tell you what it means. For those of you guys who are not, uh, you will learn about this, I'm sure, uh, later on as you proceed, especially if you're interested in STEAM type majors. So this wire, this little, this little guy here is a wire that delivers electricity into two circular pieces of metal that are inside this plastic. As electricity flows through those pieces of metal, a magnetic field is generated. Now, electricity and, magnet, uh, and magnetism are related, hence the word electromagnetism. And when we uh, deliver a strong magnetic pulse to another electrical uh, conducting type uh, uh, substance, then that area, that, that magnetic field creates electric discharges. Well, it just so happens that our brain functions through electrical discharges. So if I put a magnet on the brain, you know, in one of these areas, and if I stimulate uh, generate a, a pulse magnetic field, then the brain fires. And that's why I can do a tap on your uh, on, on the side of your head and I can see your hand twitch, or I can do it at the top of your head and see your foot twitch. And so that's what we can do that. And so that's where, uh, and but if we place this over the areas of your brain that are not functioning right for depression, then I can actually over time reduce depression. I can reduce anxiety. I can do a lot of different cool things with this technology. Uh, this is a, uh, I'm wearing the same jacket here. This is from a couple of days ago. So ignore that. But uh, uh, this is kind of how we treat these individuals. So folks will sit in the chair, we will attach the magnet to their head, and uh, we have already mapped out their brains, and we first make their hand twitch 
their thumb twitch. And that's how we do the mapping. And then based on that, we can get an idea of how far, what, what the relationship of the brain is, where the brain sits in the skull of, of each specific individual, and then treat the, uh, the areas of the brain that are not functioning well. That's one of the ways that, that one of the newer uh, 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 treatment paradigms that exist in psychiatry. And I think if you guys decide to go into medicine, especially in mental health, especially in psychiatry, then uh, I think that this is, by the time that you guys get there, this will be a lot more prevalent than it is today. You know, our practice did these studies for uh, adolescents and, you know, TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, is uh, very effective for adolescents. It's not FDA approved yet, but we're kind of working on that uh, right now. Uh, the other thing that I do is Botox. So uh, I'm sure that none of you have heard about Botox. It's not on TikTok. It's nowhere else. So it's a pretty unique and cool thing. That's I'm joking, obviously. I, I, everyone has heard about Botox to a certain degree. Botox is used for cosmetics. It also happens to be used for a lot of other things. So Botox is actually used for treatment of headaches, for example. Uh, migraine headaches uh, can be treated by paralyzing some of the muscles in the face, neck, and head using Botox. Well, it just so happens that we can also use Botox to treat uh, depression. Uh, there have been a lot of studies uh, coming out that looked at, you know, facial expressions and whether there is feedback to the brain from certain facial expressions. And if we can remove the signal going to the brain from your face by with the negative facial expressions, kind of like frowning or, or you know, or kind of a, a, a frowning or, or kind of having like a sad face. Uh, can we actually reduce depression? And it turns out that you can. So that's another treatment modality that we use. Now uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second here. Ooh, let's see here. Okay. The, uh, the other uh, areas uh, for treatment of psychiatry uh, for mental illness that we, that we utilize in psychiatry is actually uh, coming out and you'll read about this quite a bit in a lot of different newspapers and articles is psychedelics and ketamine. So I use uh, ketamine for the treatment of depression. Uh, but if you guys uh, keep up to date with uh, the news articles, and the, uh, you know, whether it's CNN, New York Times, or whatever, then you'll read that ketamine and MDMA uh, are being researched quite heavily for the treatment of depression and PTSD. You'll see that psilocybin or psychedelics is being researched for the treatment of these disorders. And you'll also see that, you know, the state of Kentucky is actually looking into studying uh, other psychedelics for the treatment of substance use disorders, like opiate use disorders and, and different types of addiction. And so, uh, and, and I bring that up to say that that you know, psychiatry is, I think, in a, I think we're seeing the sunrise on psychiatry. I don't think that we've reached the heyday of our field yet. And so for those of you who are interested in medicine, and for those of you that are interested in mental health, I think that you'll uh, appreciate uh, a lot of changes in your lifetime, and, I'm, and you should be pretty excited about it. What I do on a day-to-day -day basis is I see patients uh, in my office. I, uh, I do a few hours of lecture every six months to residents and medical students. I do a lot of research, but thankfully I'm at the part of my career where I can kind of delegate research responsibilities to students and residents and things like that. And I kind of just have a supervisory role on some of the research that I do. Um, I do uh, I do a little bit of work for the government and for the uh, you know for the city and the courts and things like that, um, but most of my time is actually spent directly delivering care because I'm really passionate about what I do. I think it's really really cool, and you know I'm I'm a brain guy. I'm a brain scientist, and I'm hoping that some of you guys choose to come down uh, this path and and uh, you know. And and uh, and take over from us because you know uh, eventually we'll all have to kind of you know ride off into the sunset. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. Whether you want to speak up or type it, it's uh, it's up to you. Oh, there's a question about uh, what does uh, ADHD uh, stand for? That's a really good question. And so uh, so ADHD is attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Uh, it's become more common recently, mostly because it's actually we're, we're learning to recognize it more. 
Uh, it's a very diverse set of symptoms that people might have. Some people might have problems with attention and concentration. Some people might have problems sitting still and being able to focus. Um, so it's not uncommon for individuals with ADHD to, uh, you know, to get distracted often, even if they really like doing the stuff, you know, you could really love your parents and want to listen to them and be, you know, good kids to your, to your folks. But when they start talking to you, you're like looking on your phone or you can't turn away from the TV or you kind of keep like drawing or something like that. And you're still listening to them, but, they, but they're saying, hey, you know, pay attention to me. You're like, I am paying attention to you. Well, that can, some of those symptoms can, can be because of ADHD, not all, but some of them can be because of ADHD. Um, and so folks with ADHD have difficulties paying attention focusing. They have uh, sometimes have difficulty sitting still. And there are treatments for ADHD that help significantly improve the quality of life of the people that uh, have that disorder. That was a really good question, because I know that a lot of, uh, you know, I'm sure that there's folks uh, in here that have ADHD uh, and are getting uh, treatment for that. Uh, I know that you guys are out of time. I know you've been here all morning, so I'm not going to take too much of your time. Any other uh, questions that I can uh, help you guys with? Hey, Dr. Farupi, thank you so much for all of that. Um, we do have another question. Could you talk about any tips you have for people who have ADHD? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank so uh, one of the tips is... Uh, is is actually to break down tasks, okay? So, uh, you know, one of the things that you might not actually, uh, um, distracted driving is actually a very common uh, uh, symptom of ADHD. And I say that knowing people that have ADHD that have gotten into a lot of car accidents. Uh, now, part of that has to do with age as well, okay? Remember, everyone here who is under the age of 25 still has a developing brain. Your brain doesn't start develop, doesn't stop developing until you hit about 25. And so while your brain is developing, you, you know, we're going to, as humans, have some areas where, you know, there's room for improvement. And so I don't want you guys to worry if you're like, man, I'm just not there yet. I still can't, you know, focus. I still can't seem to make good decisions. That's okay. You know, ask for advice from folks that are older than you, ask for advice from folks that have gone through certain things. So it's okay if you're not at a point where you're able to make a lot of decisions or you don't trust your decision, that's okay. Our brains are still developing until we hit 25. However, if you find that your focus is not where it needs to be, or you just can't get tasks done, or you start so many things, but you're not able to finish them and you really want to, and you're really down on yourself, remember to just break up apart the tasks. For example, if your mom or dad says, make your bed. Now, that alone sounds like it's a very simple task. The task is make your bed. But one of the tips that can be nice for folks with ADHD to do is break that task down into smaller steps. So step one will be, you know, uh, take the blanket off the bed. Step two would be to smooth out the sheets. Step three would be fluff the pillows. And step four would be put the pillows back on the bed. Step five would be put the comforter back on the bed, things like that. So breaking those tasks down uh, allows for your brain to really uh, not get overwhelmed by the idea of making the bed. Uh, and also, so that's that's one of the tips that I think is helpful to a lot of the patients. Uh, and I hope that's helpful to you. So any awesome. other questions, guys? So. Yeah. Um, it, any additional questions, you guys? If you want to go ahead and throw them in the chat, raise your hand. Um, thank you for sticking around, Dr. Faruqi. Thank you for your flexibility. We really appreciate it. Um, we all just get so excited about all these cool things and we have all these questions. And of course, you know, things get a little behind and we appreciate you hanging around and attendees hanging around. Um, if you do think of other questions, feel free to pass them along and we can get them to Dr. Faruqi as well. Uh, it was so cool to learn about the steam to actually see that equipment. Um, really neat, learn the science behind that equipment and all the different applications. And we appreciate the advice. I think a lot of that applies to us and uh, it's very useful to hear it coming from an expert. So uh, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you being here. Attendees, thank you for being here. Um, this is recorded and is on YouTube if you would like to see it uh, later on or share it with students who maybe missed 
uh, portions of the Youth Science Summit. Um, again, we appreciate you being here. Uh, your questions have been great. Your engagement has been great. Uh, we thank Lexmark for making this possible and our wonderful partners for engaging with us and dedicating their time and resources. Um, we will be sending that link along for the recording so that you have easy access to that um, and for the resources that the various speakers have passed along as well. Um, so. Thank you for being here today. We hope that you can join us again in the spring. Um, our next Youth Science Summit, Virtual Youth Science Summit, is slated for February 29th. So we hope to see you then and be on the lookout um, in the Teacher Catalyst, our newsletter, if you aren't already signed up for that, um, or be uh, checking out our website for more information on that. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>